Hey, hey, welcome YouTube to Gas Masks and Hand Grenades. I'm your host, Metal Madness Jeff, and today I'm stoked to bring a guy on who is frankly known in the extreme progressive experimental metal genres, but is really not mentioned in the much wider guitar circles. And after destroying my ear, ear holes the last few days with his insane playing in numerous bands and projects like Dysrhythmia, Gorgut, Sabbath Assembly, Vara, Veldun, uh, there's a whole lot of them we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm throwing the U word out there. Uh, I knew that this guy could play the guitar well. I didn't realize how amazing a player he actually is. He's scarily underrated and insanely prolific, and all guitar nerds around the world need to know about this guy, Stat. As I said, he plays in Dysrhythmia, Gorguts, Veldun, Vara, Sabbath Assembly, and several more bands that if I keep listing them, I'll run out of time to actually interview him. So, not to mention, he has just as many guest appearances to his name as the number of bands and projects he's been on or is currently in. And last but not least, he's also a guitar teacher, which we'll get into, which is one thing I didn't touch on, and I just remembered it. So we'll get on. Kev, you got to remind me of that um, at the end. Please welcome Kevin Huffnagel. How you doing, man? Hey, what's up? I did the best I could with that. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot to get out there, and yeah. I really, I truly meant it. If I was going to name every single appearance you had in every yeah. hour, yeah. it'd be a four-hour intro, man. We. Uh. <laughs> But um, well, listen, so how you doing? Good, yeah. yeah. You know, um, I, I did want to throw one thing at you right out of the way. Not to be a bummer, but I know you had you suffered a big loss here recently, man. Oh, my God. Yeah, my cat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pet deaths are, are hard, man. You know? Dude, you know, <laughs> it's so weird. Sometimes they're harder than losing people in our lives. They are. I mean, because, uh, you know, they're... It's just love, usually from a pet. There's no exactly. Comment. You don't have all the inner turmoils right. and <laughs> hatred for taking the bar of soap and you know, or leaving the yeah. toilet seat up, or you yeah. know, all that, or eating your cake that you thought you'd set. You know, I mean, yeah. you, we we as humans we grow these, you know, resentments towards one another, even family members. So it's like, yeah, yeah I'm. You, nobody says they're glad someone's dead, but it's kind of like, mm -hmm. you well. Know, Sometimes it's more complicated when a family member dies or something. Exactly. I mean, there's more yeah. uh, mixed feelings. I mean, usually sadness. Yeah. 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 But when you lose a pet, man, it's heavy. It's hard. Yeah. And you had, what was her name? Miso? Miso. Yeah. She's actually a, my, my wife's cat. You know, she, okay. had, she had the cat for 18 and a half years. Um, I've only kind of, um, you know, um, known, known this cat for the past seven years that we've been together. That's a long time in cat years though, right? Yeah, 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 and, and you know we li we, li we live together and stuff, and she's yeah, she's my little buddy, so I'll miss her, you know. But we'll we'll probably get some some new, one or two new cats. Uh, of course, you, you know you will, you know you will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the thing is, the intro really isn't that much of a high. It's not that hyperbolic. Um, mm -hmm. We're gonna get into all that stuff that you've got going on because you've got a mm -hmm. lot of stuff going on, and I spent a lot of time digging down into it. And was pretty, as we talked about before we went live, I was pretty blown away. Now, my experience with you primarily came initially, I knew about dysrhythmia. I didn't right. know about dysrhythmia. I just knew of the, of the band. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think you also were from the Philly area. Are you from the Philly area? Yeah, or? yeah. I went to school in Philly and uh, to college, uh, went to college in Philly at University of the Arts. Are you, where are you from though, originally? Are you um, Maryland. I mean, I was born, born in Baltimore. Oh, uh, Baltimore. Okay. Yeah, I lived in Canesville, right outside of Baltimore when I was yep. a kid. Lived in yep. North Jersey. Lived in Northern Virginia. Lived in Philly. Kind of moved around the East Coast a lot. But well, I'm a Pennsylvania. Kid. I'm a Pennsylvania guy. I'm up in Lancaster. You probably okay, yeah, been there. Yeah. Have you been here mm -hmm. for Amish? I'm sure. We have. I played a solo show there. Uh, Did you play have, it at the Chameleon? No. Um, it was like a uh, God. I can't remember the name of the place. It was kind of like a like a. It was a funny show. It was kind of like an Irish pub kind of place or something. Actually. Oh, um, um, Molly, uh, shit. Molly, I can't remember the damn name of it. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even, even if you mentioned, it, I wouldn't remember. Okay. <laughs> it was like a restaurant. It was it, so. Kind of a restaurant. Yeah, and there, yeah. They had like a nice, it was nice. You know, they had like a stage. Oh, it's a real and, nice place. Yeah. 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 Really. And the town was beautiful. I had a great breakfast the next day. Did you play like, in there or outside? Uh, inside. Okay. Inside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's called Molly Flanagan's or something like that. I'm terrible with that stuff myself. But um, so uh, let's see where are we at here. I want to make sure I had a thought there and I I lost it. Um, oh, so you went you we went to college in Philly. You went to yeah. music school or what? 
Yeah, I went to uh, University of the Arts for jazz guitar was my main ma- my major. Okay. Yeah, and then I graduated from there, and I ended up that was in '98 when I graduated, and I ended up staying staying in Philly till 2005, and then I okay. moved to New York, and that's where I've been ever since. Are you where? Are you in like Brooklyn? Or are you in Manhattan? I'm, I'm in Queens. Queens. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, a neighborhood called Woodhaven, which is pretty nice, um, out by a park called Forest Park. Yeah, and you've been uh, up there quite a while, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I've looked um, all around various parts of, of Queens and, and and Brooklyn a little bit here too, too, but um. But yeah, Woodhaven is kind of the area I've lived in the, the the most since I've lived in New York. Okay, so I know where I was going with that. My experience with you is that um, uh, other than knowing about Dysrhythmia, of course, I became aware of you on my radar with Colored Sands, with Gorgas. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then I didn't catch you on that tour, but I caught you on the Pleiades Dust Tour. Mm-hmm. And I saw you at the Metro Gallery down in Baltimore. And mm-hmm. we talked after the show. I don't know if you, I had much shorter hair back then. I'm okay. now a long hair like you. But and, and you meet a lot of people, so I wouldn't expect you to remember. But funny story about that show was that I was wearing a um I knew that Luke was a fan of Porcupine Tree. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I've done some work for that band, as I mentioned to you, and you know, know all the guys. And I was wearing a signified shirt. I don't know if you're familiar with their catalog. Yeah, I know that. Album. Mm-hmm. So Signify, I'm wearing this shirt, and I, I'm with my kid, and we walk up to the merch thing, and I'm looking at shirts, and and Luke comes behind the, the thing, mm-hmm. and I'm like, he says, oh, great shirt. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I said, I wore it, and I just it just hit me right off the cuff. I'm going to mm-hmm. pull this little joke. I'm like, yeah, I wore it because I know Luke's like a big porcupine tree fan. He goes, oh, yes, I, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, where, where's he at? Like, is, does he come out? Like, does he ever come out and talk to people and stuff like he's like, no, no, it, it is me. I, I am Luke. And I'm like, no, no, no. Luke, this, you know, the guitar player singer for Gorgots. He's like, no, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I, he must've thought I was insane. I'm like, Luke, I know it's you, dude. <laughs> but that also sounds like the kind of thing he would do. He has that same sense of humor. Oh yeah. He laughed, laughed <laughs> like crazy, man. Uh, just a warm guy. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but, um, <laughs> But I, I saw you play there, and the one thing that struck me was this fucking dude's playing it. As, by the way, I use the F-bomb a little bit, and if you uh, want to, feel free to. Okay. This is a not safe for work stream uh, um, or kids. Uh, yeah, the one thing I kept thinking was he's fucking playing an SG? Like, what is he playing an SG doing this kind of metal? That's like a that's a Frank Marino guitar, man. That's a blues guitar, right? It has that reputation. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I've heard that a lot over the years with in this room is when I was playing Strats, people thought it was weird. And then in Gorgas, when I was playing SGs, people thought it was weird. Um, Just out of curiosity, did you do anything with it? Because what no, I didn't modify was... it at all. I mean, the, the SG is just like stock pickups. Um, okay. It's a heavy sounding guitar. You know, I mean, but as far as tuning, because what tuning yeah. are you guys playing in? Uh, most of it is uh, C standard. You know, so oh, it is C standard. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of songs, I, that are like slightly altered, like uh, you know, a slightly different tune than that. But m- most of it is C standard. Yeah. Wow. Now, you know, it's been seven years since I saw you, but I always thought listening to them, I'm like, man, they got to be in some t- sort of weird alternate tuning in like B or something like that. It always just, and I'm not, I'm, I have a good ear. I'm a player, and I, I can play pretty well, but the weird sort of dissonant sort of stuff that mm-hmm. you do with primarily with, with him and, and or with him, but with the band, with mm-hmm. the Gorgots and, and your dysrhythmia and stuff, I'm always here and I'm like, is that, is that well, standard? The, the dysrhythmia stuff is, is all of that. I mean, most of that is in to alternate tunings. Like, oh, okay, it is. Right, many okay. have a wide assortment of tunings that I use for dysrhythmia. Okay. But, um, Gorgots, we'll I talk, we'll talk about that when we get there. Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to first ask you about was, you know, uh, can, may I ask how old you are? Uh, I, I can't remember. I'm uh, 46 now. Okay. So you're about not quite 10 years younger than me. I'll, uh, well, no, you are because I'm 56. I just forgot. <laughs> it's like <laughs> what happens. You get all, you I, I was going to say I'm going to be 56. No, I'm, I'm going to be 57 in March. So tell me a little bit about your experience as a kid and mm-hmm. what – kind of memories of music and early exposure to music kind yeah. of affected you on a visceral and emotional and physical level. What do you remember? Were there any cool experiences as a kid that you remember and like music played a part or a band or a song played a part? 
yeah, music was a huge part of my childhood and I got into it like pretty early on because my, in particular my mom's side, my mom and just her side of the family in general is pretty uh, musical, kind of the, they're the musical side of the family. Um, like my grandfather played piano and, and even composed some music. Um, my grandmother was like a, just a big music fan and she turned me on to like Julian Bream and a lot of classical guitar players and stuff. Um, my mom played guitar. Um, her sister, my aunt Gwen, um, played piano and sang, and she's into like lots of avant-garde classical music and stuff. And she was always buying me like really weird <laughs> classical music and stuff for for Christmas, you know, when I was a yeah. kid. So I was lucky to have, yeah, just like all this cool music being played around me and stuff. But do you mean do you remember any like specific things? Like for example, I always say, and maybe you saw this. I always tell people that you know I have two, a couple very key things i remember was the first one was bridge over troubled water by simon and garfunkel mm -hmm. we're talking 1972 because i was born in 66 so i'm mm -hmm. five or six years old at this point carol king tapestry mm -hmm. you know i feel the earth move you know that um james taylor's sweet baby james with mm -hmm. you know and then beethoven beethoven's fifth yeah you know, oh, yeah i mean just those are seared into my dna in my head that made me go oh i want to do something and i got a guitar at eight i didn't really get serious about playing till i was like 14 or 15 mm -hmm. i pretended to be paul stanley most of the time or ace or whatever but mm -hmm. but do you have any of those type things pretty similar to yours like my mom also has a lot of like folk music simon and garfunkel jim croce all this john baez all that kind of stuff and a lot of classical music so yeah and, and i always like the moodiness you know the the, the dark moodiness of, of even stuff like simon and garfunkel you know oh. i i just was my ears were drawn to that as a kid and um I, I feel like that shaped my taste in like moody dark melancholic music oh yeah you yeah. know um so probably yeah classical and folk were probably like the first kinds of music i heard that i was like um you know this is intriguing like what is music is this is what music is you know uh, i like the way this sounds but, I, but my earliest memory of like um, hearing like guitar and being like, what is that? I need to play that instrument is um, when Thriller came out, my mom bought the record. and ah, da, 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 da. Yeah, right when Beat It started. Now, the riff intrigued me. But then, of course, when I got to the solo. I was like, what is what is that? Like, what is making that sound? So that really, I always credit that as kind of like my sort of my earliest memory of music that really blew my mind is um, in particular the Eddie Van Halen's guitar solo and Beat It. Oh. Yeah, and dude, I mean, let's be honest, man. That <laughs> thriller is just a masterpiece. It's a great album. It's just yeah. unbelievable. Every <laughs> every freaking song is just a masterclass in production. And yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, that's Quincy uh, Jones, of course. Mm -hmm. But I mean, and actually, what was the one uh, off the wall? Was yeah, that's a great record too. A stunningly killer album, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not. I'm an MJ dude man all mm -hmm. through and through you know that's high school now i'm in high school you're younger mm -hmm. much younger but i'm you know beat it came that was 83 i believe yeah, it was 82 80 i think it was 83 but maybe i'm not 100 sure but. but i remember riding to you know um riding to um track meets mm -hmm. and we're cranking the you know pyt and billy jean i mean billy yeah. jean what a killer track man mm -hmm. like ah like, you ever see chris cornell do that no, uh, you got to look up Chris Cornell doing Billie Jean on acoustic. I've seen Watchtower doing that song. Really? What, wait, Watchtower? <laughs> Watchtower. With um, with Jason, uh, yeah, and I, I think it was when Jason McMaster was still in the band. I, I had this old like um, VHS like bootleg of Watchtower, like some early show. I guess when Ron Jarzombic first joined. That's and bizarre. They, uh, yeah, they cover. I, I don't think they. Yeah, they do like um, at least up to the chorus. I mean, they do, like half the song. Wow, I gotta I gotta hunt that down. That's pretty it crazy. Might be on I, never, I never tried to look it up on YouTube, but maybe it's on there. Um <clears throat> so what was guitar your first instrument or did your mom make you do piano or no uh no one yeah, like no one forced music upon me, you know, it was just kind of around and I just naturally fell in love with it. Um my mom, like I said, she played guitar. I mean she doesn't she plays she probably still plays a little bit here and there, but like not as much as she used to, but she, anyway, she had like an acoustic guitar kind of always lying around the house. So I think from a pretty young age, I would, I would, I didn't really start playing the guitar until I got my own guitar at age 10. But before that, you know, probably around age eight or nine, you know, I would, I would pick up her guitar and just sort of like make noise, 
banging on and strum it, trying to strum it. And make. Was yeah. your mom just like a chordal player, I'm assuming? or Yeah, just kind of just chords, just kind of yeah. like folk songs and stuff. But um, yeah, and I got my own guitar at age 10. What, and what it, was your first guitar, do you remember? Yeah, it was a, a brand called Series 10. Which okay, is that's uh, a new one. Mine yeah. was a mine was a Stella. Oh, okay. And it was a Sunburst though, so it was mm -hmm. pretty rad looking for mm -hmm. for an eight year old to have a Sunburst, you know, three quarter length guitar. But it, I God knows where that ever got to. I have no idea where they. I'm sad too. I don't know where my first whatever happened to my first guitar. Yeah, it's, I have no idea. Yeah. Um. Do you play anything else? I did try to. Um. I did take cello lessons for. I'm not like six months or something around age 19 or something. Uh, I really love cello. I really love drums. I mean, I, I yeah. love, I wish I could play every instrument. Who doesn't, you know? Um, I mean, yeah, I guess you, something I, I thought know, obviously I was, you'd play bass, right? I mean, because any guitar player can play bass, but yeah, I get know, around on bass. Right. And then I would imagine you can plunk around on keyboards enough yeah. to just be dangerous, right? I mean, I took piano, you know, in, in school, um, in, in college mainly, you know, I had to, had to take a piano course. I, yeah, okay. I, can, I can read music, I can play piano. And yeah, do some stuff on stage. Can you sight read? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sort of guitar and stuff like that? Okay. Yeah, that was the first thing I learned how to do. Like uh, when I first got a guitar, my mom kind of signed me up for lessons right away. And the first thing we did was learn out of that Mel Bay. Mel Bay primer, man. <laughs> yeah. Looking, you know, it was boring, but I was I was pretty patient. You know, I'm glad I was patient. It was just like, all right, let me just kind of like learn the fundamentals, learn what a quarter note is and learn how to read music and then we can get to the fun stuff after. I yeah, I was always, um, I was always like, "Fuck that shit!" I just want to learn how to shred. What you know, I want to learn to play. Like now, for me, the big influences that started to hit me in my you know eight to ten range was Steve Howe, mm -hmm. of course. You know, because I started to assimilate a little bit, and and of course Paul and John, or well, Paul was bass, but I mean John and George, and then. You know, Alex Lifeson was my God, still is my God. You know, yeah, yeah. nobody touches Alex. He's way up here and everybody else. Is. And I love all those other guys. Yeah. But Alex is the guy that made me go, I want to play guitar. And mm -hmm. just, you know, I think everybody uses that word. Oh, he's underrated. Oh, she's underrated. That guy's mm -hmm. underrated. Mm -hmm. Alex isn't underrated, but he really is. I know what you mean. I mean, the, the band is very popular, you know. Um, right. Uh, but yeah, people tend to focus on Neil and Getty a lot more. Um, yeah, and I guess it's because Alex is more, you know, he's more subdued. He's more of a, he's more stealthy, you know? Um, he's stealthy. That's a good way yeah. to put it. And he's, he's capable of filling the, their sound, mm -hmm. particularly in those albums, like from like, you know, uh, moving pictures through maybe Grace Under Pressure, where they I love Grace Under Pressure. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's such a it's such a cold alien sounding. Yeah, album. I love that album. It's so beautiful, oh, Red Sector it. and yeah, yeah. After Image. A lot of the tracks you don't talk about, like uh, beneath between the wheels, and just yeah, yeah. That's that might you know sometimes that's my some days that's my favorite Rush record. <laughs> Is it really? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's a, kind of a, just a very dark record. I, it's very I dark. Like it. dystopian. It has that yeah, dystopian yeah. feel to it. I you know I came in my very first record with Rush was was um um yeah <laughs> hemispheres okay yeah and you know and i'll never forget it. we were my mom and i were walking through the greens point mall in in uh houston texas well, i lived mm -hmm. down there for four years <clears throat> and um i'm walking by and i saw a guy at in a, a guy older than me called flake we called him flake because he was like yeah. the stoner in eighth grade and i'm in like seventh grade right I'm like mm -hmm. man i want to be like that guy i want to be that yeah. You know, and I hadn't really <laughs> dabbled and experimented yet. I didn't, I might have, but I wanted to be like Flake, and he came in with the Star Man and the Rush. I'm like, I don't know who that is, but I have to. That guy likes him. I'm gonna like him, right? right, right. Yeah. And we're walking through the, the the department store, and there's the gatefold of Hemispheres. Mm. And my mom was probably like, "Why does my 13 year old, kid, 12 year old, 13 year old kid want a album with a naked dude on it in a, you know, on a plane?" You know. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But that that's sex, you know, we could talk rush all night, so let's get because <laughs> I I'll keep it there. Yeah. Um, when did you realize that you wanted to be a musician as a possible career, or are you still realizing that? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question because I knew I wanted to make music and play music like as soon as I got a guitar. Um 
you know, and I and I <clears throat> I had a, a couple of bands and things in high school, and you know, we made some demos. And then, um, but yeah, I never really thought about like touring or like putting out records or anything until kind of right after Dysrhythmia kind of started. You know, um, we wrote some songs, we started playing some shows, and then our original bass player Clayton. Mm -hmm. uh, was like we should buy a van and like go on tour and book our own tour. He kind of came from more of this like DIY yeah, well, I think like a, punk, like a punk ethos sort of. Yeah, which was great because I was just like, you can do that. Oh, okay, let's do that. You know, and then yeah, and then once we started touring and we started putting out records, and then you know, and I was like, oh yeah, I guess this is yeah, this is this is what you do when you write. How you do it, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, did you ever have any other idea or plan for a type of career? Were you thinking, oh, maybe I'll yeah, maybe I'll get the degree in, you know, you, you got the, the degree in, in obviously in jazz guitar and whatnot, but yeah. were you ever thinking like, you know, maybe I should have a plan B for architect or, you know. You know, I, I really, um, God, especially back then, I never thought beyond today. <laughs> it's, you know, I really. It's still don't most days. Yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't really have a plan B. I don't know. I mean, I always thought, um, I guess, I, you know, I always thought I would teach and that that is what ended up happening. You know, I teaching now as my sort of main source of income you know which mm -hmm. i really love you know um it's great I, I feel lucky that i get to now do you teach privately or do you teach at a college or, or both? Or? privately privately okay yeah. yeah well we'll have to talk about that um yeah. down the road i mean because yeah. i could definitely use some things that i want to work on that are you know things that i i should be better at and i'm not you know i mean i again i come from the the school of I'm more of a blues guitar that can play flashy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things like sweet picking and things like that do not come naturally to me at all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I can do triad sweeps and things like that. I also have this weird finger. Like a bent finger. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got uh, a soccer injury and that makes, mm -hmm. you know, you'll appreciate this. Or at least I think you will. I used to be able to play lay it down. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's I, a can't, stretch, a I can't chord. do that. I can't do that chord anymore. I have a couple students that have that have um you know have had sports injuries that they, and their fingers are bent and stuff and it's yeah it's a, it's a can be a challenge to kind of try to help them with that you know like playing well, I was, chord. I and, was told this was going to be they put a fake knuckle in here. I oh no no you'll be fine after physical therapy and blah blah blah. What they <laughs> didn't tell me was and I found out later was the doctor had to pull the tendon down because it was mm -hmm. torn so badly. And it just never, now I'm like, man, you know, I, I didn't want to be the guy with the finger stuck out right. all the time, which was my other option was to have it fused. Uh, so they put the fake knuckle in there. I'm like, oh, mm. good. I can, I can make, you know, a closed fist. Mm. Well, that's great. Except for, you know, and, and let's look, let's be honest here. Tony Iommi is missing a tip of his finger, but even more than him, Django pretty much did what he did with yeah. two fingers. So yeah. It can be done, and I've learned most of my way around it. It's just doing those wide sweeps. I can't. I, can't do them. I know I'll never be able to probably do them. So, well, but if you can make me do them with some training, I'll, I'll pay you extra or something. Like that. <laughs> no, it's good to make. It's. Uh, I mean, for me, it's all about making the most of your limitations. Like I always want to progress and get better and better at something, but also, um, you know, working with limitations can be a good thing sometimes. Sure. Sure. Um, what guitarists, musicians, artists really affected you and influence? I heard you talk, I think, about Randy Rhodes, but um, who were the, the, the players that, as a young player, you're like going, okay, that's the guy, or those are the guys right there. You know, for me, like I said, Lifeson, Steve Howe, Frank Marino was huge for me. Mm -hmm. I still think that guy may be the biggest underrated player ever because he was fucking smoking back then in the 70s way faster than most everybody else was playing and and um so yeah well um you know or was there um are there any other influences not solely like just guitarists that had a memorable effect on your playing or writing um you know early i <coughs> early on <coughs> sorry <coughs> yeah i got something going too we're, we're sinus thing um yeah early on i mean it was like a lot of the, a lot of the typical influences you probably expect from from that period in time of like the mid eighties, you know, I was, I kind of yeah. feel like I discovered, you know, metal kind of like all at once. I just kind of liked, I kind of liked everything, you know, at first, like the matter for twisted sister or anthrax or mm -hmm. like, I was just like, this is all awesome. You know? Um, but yeah, some of my, um, I mean, some of my earliest influences that I still consider like 
and in, influential on me are uh, George Lynch, actually. Oh, you know, I, I think, he's, yeah, he, he was definitely an early fave of mine that I still, I still feel like I'm influenced by the city. That vibrato, really, that vibrato, really unique player. I, I like that. He's still, um, yeah, trying to, he's not, he's not just stuck in the eighties either. You know, he's still trying to do new things even today, you know, which I think he's doing cool. a lot more blues based stuff now. And he's playing with his fingers almost exclusively. Yeah, kind of like this more Jeff Beck kind of he thing. He wants more of a Jeff Beck thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, so yeah, players like him, you know, I liked Inve, you know, of course, back in the day, um, all those shrapnel records kind of dudes, oh, you know, dudes uh, like Michael Lee Ferkins. Do you remember him? I remember him. Yeah. He wasn't one that I got super into at the time. I feel like I might appreciate him more now because he was like more of like a country ish kind of. Yeah. A little bit of a, yeah. He had a little bit I of like a, I would appreciate that more. I should go check it out now because I feel like back. Chicken picking. He did some cool chicken picking. Yeah. yeah. Right I think yeah, back guys time, like, I, um, I was more into like the darker sounding, like, like Marty Friedman and Cacophony and that. Kinda, right. And Racer X. More. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Racer X. And of course, fucking um Tony McAlpine, man. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Maximum security. Oh god. Yeah. I remember getting the first one where it's the weird album cover with I don't know the name of it, where it looks like there's like a gorilla hands or something. I would like the is it the Edge of Sanity or something? Edge of Sanity, that's it. Yeah, yeah man. Ah oh. <clears throat> that dude is here's another guy that Guitarists know, you know, you know, right? Mm -hmm. We're all fucking nerds and we follow these trails to all these guys, right? Mm -hmm. But, but you know, like Tony was one of those guys that you're like, man, why, why didn't he quite break out like Satch or Vi? Because he's as good, if not quite frankly, better. I'm mm -hmm. not, and that's no diss on Satch or Vi because mm -hmm. they're icons, but you know, there's Stevie Solace. Do you remember him? Stevie Solace Color Code? Yeah, I remember the name. Uh, like guitar ads with him. He was a little I, bit I, more funk based, a yeah. little bit more funk metal. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, man. I mean, those those shrapnel bands, and and you're talking about the shrapnel guitarist, but there were some killer shrapnel bands. Like, do you remember band Fifth Angel? Oh, yeah, I love Fifth Angel. Yeah, dude, that first Fifth Angel album just is yeah, it's great. <clears throat> my favorite album, man. Yeah, yeah. But um, okay, so how encouraging it sounds to me like your parents were very encouraging and nurturing as far right. as your creative stuff. Was that was that the case? It was, yeah. I was really lucky. Like they didn't try to discourage me from pursuing music at all. They, they like only only encouraged it, which I, I'm really grateful for. They're still down in Maryland. Uh, yeah, they're in Northern Virginia. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, not not too far from DC. Um, yeah, so I, I'm I'm I was lucky that that uh, they didn't they didn't discourage me from wanting to pursue music. You know, I think they realized that like. Um, I'm sure other people said this too, you know, it's like it, and when you're really obsessed with like something, you know, um, you, you know, you, you pretty much just stay in your room and obsess over that thing. And for yeah. me, it was playing guitar. So I think my, my parents were just like, well, he's just in his room playing guitar. We don't he's not out shooting heroin or killing yeah. people or whatever. He's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, I think they saw it was a healthy thing, you know, and, um, when did you start though? <laughs> real seriously. When did you say again? <laughs> so age 10 is when I, I, I got a guitar and I, I start. That's when I started like taking lessons and, and playing like every day. Okay. All right. Yeah. And did, did, were you the, it sounds like you were, but cause I wasn't, but were you the typical kid, the typical story of the obsessed kid that literally would woodshed for you go to school, you'd come home, you pick up the guitar until you pretty much went to bed. You were playing. Yeah, pretty much. I, I, I played all the time. Um, and I, I was lucky in that, uh, in ninth grade, my freshman year in high school, I met, um, this other guitar player was a couple years older than me at school. And um, we started a band together that was together for like three years or something. And only did a demo that never even was released, but it was such a valuable. What was, was that? Which one project was that? Was that uh, gray? <laughs> no. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's something called gray division blue that actually did put out, did release our demo. That okay. was more of a, a, an acoustic classical instrumental thing but okay me and this guy chris i'm talking about we had we had kind of like a prog metal band called the fifth season and yeah okay, um, i was going to ask about that okay yeah and, um th i think there's other bands with that same name out there that are probably prog metal too but um was it was it like a dream theater type thing uh, not as not as uh you know techie as dream theater. it was more like a queen drag fates warning kind oh of okay thing. okay yeah well, great um, company there yeah so anyway i learned a lot from from playing with him i progressed really fast by playing in a band with that guy and having to sort of learn his riffs and learn how to play in all these new keys I've never played in before and playing odd time signatures. Our drummer was also really good, you know, so 
I've always been lucky to kind of surround myself with these players that are like better than me. And, and then yeah. I have to like keep up with them. And that that's been like the best thing for me. It's funny you mention that. Cause um, <coughs> I don't know if you saw, but it's really worth, worth checking out. Um, you into atheist at all? Mm -hmm. yeah. So Kelly and I did a super long interview and he's just a sweetheart. And we're actually, mm -hmm. we're going to do something together. He's going to start coming on my show and we're going to do some segments together. But um, <laughs> He said, man, you know, I'm always the worst guy in my bands. Like, and, and that's, that's the joy of it is that I don't believe that with you, but um, he, you know, I, in the way that he said it, he was being very sincere. He's like, I'm, you know, my guitar is, I'm a blues guitarist. I don't write like Rand Berkey and I don't play like Rand Berkey mm -hmm. or Max Phelps or, you know, any of these, these hotshot young guitar or, you know, the guys in, you know, Paul Masvidal or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. um, so I get what you're saying. And I generally the bands that I were in, and it was mainly cover bands. I never, any time I tried to get something original going, uh -huh. somebody flake out. And I never had the, unlike you who stuck to maybe, you know, the guitar, like that's what I'm going to do for a uh -huh. life living. I was always torn with, well, my mom wants me to go to college and I don't really want to go, but I guess I better get a degree. And, yeah. oh, there's chicks and booze there. I'm coming. Mm -hmm. I'm going there. That's where I'm going. And mm -hmm. so it was always like that. So my playing really didn't accelerate a lot until you know, I was almost in college when I really mm -hmm. started to really go, oh, you know, maybe if you'd have paid more attention to this, you'd be much better guitar and you'd be out doing things, you know, with it. But um, <coughs> so where did the so when you you go to college down in Philly and then. Mm -hmm. Was Dysrhythmia the first project that happened, or what was? Yeah, I asked about Great Division Blue, and you said it was an acoustic sort of thing. What about While Heaven Wept? You were part of that for a short while, yeah, just like for like a summer. But like, um, yeah, Tom Phillips from While Heaven Wept, uh, we went to high school together actually, and um, yeah, so uh, he was like an old friend, and yeah, there was one um record where I think we we're gonna do some shows, and I kind of I learned, I remember like learning like a set and I guess I was going to play a show that never happened. And then I was also um, supposed to play on, on one of their records called uh, sorrow of the angels. But I think I was just supposed to do the acoustic guitar parts on the record or something like that. Okay. And then anyway, we, we did it. We, I recorded my parts. Um, he ended up um, scrapping the whole thing and starting over again. And then at that point um, I just didn't have time really to dedicate to, to, to that band so I, I left so yeah it was kind of a brief what were they what were they like what was their style doom yeah it's, it's like yeah it's kind of classic uh you know kind of more coming from like the candle mass candle type mass type thing yeah. okay yeah sabbath sort of vibe um <clears throat> so dysrhythmia then becomes the real first catalyst, first engine yeah that was like as soon as i graduated from college i, I started dysrhythmia like pretty much immediately um were there guys that you knew from from school or what yeah so um the original bass player in this room his name was clayton um he he was the other guy in greater vision blue which so clayton and i also went we went to high school together as well so that's where okay I him. and mm -hmm. then we went to uarts together as well so he's kind of been there a constant yeah a constant there um you know the whole time throughout half of high school and all of college so yeah so anyway we we both graduate and we're like let's start an instrumental band you know and um yes we did and we wrote like like five or six songs, just the two of us on guitar and bass. It took us um, a while to find a, a, a drummer. Um, we auditioned a bunch of different people and nothing was working out. And then um, the story of actually how we found our drummer, Jeff, is kind of funny. Um, uh, I had a dream, I was, uh, I had a dream one night that uh, a friend came into the job I was working at and asked me what I was up to. And I said, um, I'm trying to start this band, but I can't find a drummer. And he was like, you should call my friend Jeff. He's waiting or something like that. Okay. It wasn't <laughs> me. I swear it wasn't me. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, and I, and I, and I, and I woke up and I, and, um, sorry, I forgot the first half of this story. What happened in real life was in real life, I was working at this restaurant. This guy I went to school with came in, asked, just like in the dream, asked me what I was up to. He said, I'm trying to find a drummer. And he gave me the phone number for this guy, Jeff, who I didn't know at all. And, um, you know, I put it in my pocket and I kind of just, you know, like a week or two went by, I just never called them. I was getting kind of like bummed out. Everyone we were jamming with wasn't working out. Right. Okay. So I, I, 
that came before the dream. So then two weeks after he gives me the number in, in, in real life, I have the dream and the dream is just like what happened in real life. He comes into the restaurant, asks me what I'm doing. But in the, in the dream, he's like, oh. call Jeff. He tells me to call Jeff. So I wake up in the dream and I'm like, oh yeah, I saw that guy's number. I, I, I never called him. So I did the next day and we set up a time to meet. We played and, and, and me and Clayton, the original bass player at the time, we were just like, all right, this is the guy. Like, Wow. Yeah. That's that's pretty bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you talk about synchronicity. That's a little yeah. more than that, I would think, right? Yeah. That's crazy. That's pretty cool. So so Dysrhythmia starts, um, what year was that? Nine, 98? 90, 98, summer of 98. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how do you get a contract or how do you end up putting out that first album? What was the story? Uh, we have a record that like a lot, a lot of people know about and it's totally fine because I don't really like like it. But our technically our first record is this um, record called Contradiction that we just kind of self-released, um, fi pressed 500 CDs and that was that. And they've long since, you know, sold out or whatever. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, and then we put out uh, uh that was in so that record came out we came out in 2000 and then in 2001 we put out a record called no no interference that that's kind of the first we kind of consider that one like the right. real official record um the production was like a little bit better the songs were better um um yeah what, then, label, uh, that, what label is that so that was just another self-released thing oh self-released okay um but it got some decent press like it got reviewed in modern drummer and oh, wow press. and i was just sending stuff out myself just Right, right. Not in the dark. I just like go through yeah. magazines and write down addresses and just. And I, and I was doing some kind of funny with the dysrhythmia stuff. I was, I was like trying not to overhype it. I didn't inc even include a bio. I just, um, I included sort of a cryptic postcard that just said, "Please listen" or, or like "Listen to this" or something. And that's all it said. And then the CD, yeah. it kind of worked. And, um, but anyway, we did a lot of touring, um, between two thousand one and two thousand two, and that started to catch the attention of of Relapse Records, who were kind of based basically in Philadelphia. Yep. Um, yeah, then we signed the Relapse in 2002. Um, in yeah, they right. had the store down there on the corner of 4th and South. Yeah, I worked there for a little yeah. bit. Did you really? Yeah. Well, here's a crazy story. And you, If you know the history of Relapse, they're from up here. They're actually yeah, by Lancaster, right? They started in Millersville, which yeah, is yeah, where yeah. I went to college. And mm. no shit, I, this is crazy. So I one day I had to, I had to go back in this group of – there was a bunch of condos around, but there was a, I don't know what you call it. It's not a strip mall. Cause it was like back in, it was just some, like, they look like condos, but they were businesses, right? Business offices. And I went back there. I don't know what it was a dentist thing or something. I came, I think it was a dentist appointment. I came down and I'm like, that looks like a freaking record shop over there. What the hell? I walk in and, and it's a record shop. And mm -hmm. this is probably, ah, man, I want to say it's, 97 or 98 mm. and i'm looking around and i'm like what the f you know at this point in 97 98 i i i know of bands like the, the florida bands i know mm. of cannibal i know of morbid i know of um uh, what's his name damn it <laughs> oh, shit oh come on man legion all right uh, dsi Deicide, yeah. And I know, you know, of course, the, the upside down cross. And I'm like, man, this this shit scares me a little bit, you know. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. This stuff's this stuff's really evil, man. These people are, and I'm not a religious person, but I'm like, this these people really believe this shit. They're crazy. But I remember walking around, and I'm thinking, now I think back and I'm like, oh my God, dude, I could have had some of the most killer collectible stuff that's worth so much money if i'd just known a little bit more of what was going on at the time uh, but they ended up moving and i don't know are you familiar with metal maniacs yeah mm -hmm. okay so marty rithkin is a good bu buddy of mine i don't know if you know him marty yeah. worm marty worm was wrote for them he actually came out here i lived literally no joke quarter of a mile from the relapse store that was up here originally he uh -huh. came out here and helped them move to that store down in philly which is crazy uh -huh. okay and then two years forward, when you said you got signed in 2002? Or 2002, put, yeah. I'm walking around in that store, and this ungodly album comes on. I'm like, mm -hmm. I got to get that. I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's in that stack if we get to those tonight. Okay. But I will yeah. tell you when we get there. That was my first death metal purchase. Mm -hmm. And then Catatonia's last fair, fair deal was planned. Mm -hmm. Never heard of them, man. So mm -hmm. I really got into death metal myself, or what I would call more extreme metal. Mm -hmm. in 2001 when blackwater park came out because i steven wilson and i were 
close and in contact a lot. And he's like, dude, you got to check this out. And I'm like, yeah, man, the music's great, but those vocals, come on. He's like, um, you sent me a bunch of frontline assembly. What's the difference? I'm like, oh, yeah, you're kind of right. So that's where I came at. But it's just crazy that that store down there. So you end up putting your first album out through Relapse on in 2002 then. Uh, 2003 is when, yeah, Great. when the record came out, it was called Pretest. Yeah. And we did three, three records with, with Relapse and a live, a live thing. And then, and then we moved on to other labels after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, given the complex style of Dysrhythmia's music, were you able, were, you did say that you did tour. Were you able to get many touring opportunities in the zeros, in the odds or where? Were you doing your own thing, creating the, the, the demand for it? Well, we did a lot of just, you know, that like playing tons of basement shows and hole in the walls thing. Um, from yeah. Like, yeah, from like, it really picked up in 2001. I say from 2000, 2001, 2002 was like when we were doing a lot of our own just DIY touring, but we would do like four tours a year at least, you know, like for wow. like a month, you know, um, and just book it all ourselves. And just plowing into a cargo van. and, and, and it's, Yeah, just into our, our thousand dollar van and. We just went for it and and those were you know those were fun times actually um but you did that when you're in your 20s you know right i wouldn't i couldn't do that now yeah, i mean exactly. i say it's fun now but yeah um, but it actually did feel fun at the time most of the time it was just exciting though just like yeah just um play for new people every night and, and there were people there you know and, and people were starting to come back after a while you know kept playing the same places over and over again like little rock arkansas was like a place we played a lot you know and that became okay. a really good city for us uh, um after a while but anyway, um, yeah, and then we signed to Relapse, and then you know, in particular with the with the first record we put out in Relapse, we got a lot of good opportunities on that record, and we took most of them. You know, we we did tours with you know, Dillinger Escape Plan, Mastodon, like a oh, lot yeah. of the Relapse bands, High and Fire, sure, yeah, um, all that stuff, and that was great and super fun. And back back then, do you remember? Were you getting like thirty minute sets, or were you getting like twenty minute sets, or what? Do you remember? Well, we always um, even at our own show or like if we were playing last or whatever we, we would usually not play more than 45 minutes anyway our kind of music i don't really like to play long sets i feel like it's better just to kind of yeah i mean yeah. it's weird uh, like a lot of i like a lot of dissonant music and i like mm -hmm. a lot of angular music and we're, we're going to talk about the last album um that and i don't forgive me because i listened to it today and i forget the mm -hmm. name of it but um something it's two words right uh, terminal threshold terminal threshold yeah mm -hmm. um you do a great job of knowing when to cut because mm -hmm. that it's heady music that takes a lot of focus and mm -hmm. you could really, if you did a 60 minute album of that, man, it, you're going to hit a burnout point somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Cause it's just, it's too much information coming at you. you yeah, know? I agree. Um, what, uh, let's see. Yeah. What led you to this path with this? Cause there had to be some influences there with like atheists and things like that. What led you to do something that was musically pretty non-commercial and difficult yeah. to garner an audience with? You know, it was um, just, a, we just wanted to um, challenge ourselves, you know, and, and just do something that we felt like we haven't heard a million times already, you know? Um, right. And um yeah, it's funny because we, you know, we decided right pretty much right away to be an instrumental band. Um, but we didn't really have a lot of instrumental band influences, you know what I mean? Like all yeah. our all our influences early on were, you know, things like yeah, things like atheist and we were like it's funny because like the mixture of influences between the three of us was was pretty interesting and I think made for like an interesting sound right off the bat. Like our I was kind of the 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 metal guy in the band. Right. Um yeah, our bass player was kind of more like, like I said, more like the hardcore punk guy, but also really into like post-punk and goth and avant-garde classical music. Yeah, you know, so. Oh, wow. That was interesting. And then our drummer, you know, he was kind of a jazz guy and prog guy, you know. Yeah, I was thinking like Mahavishnu. I hear a little bit yeah. of Billy Cobham and, you know, Tony yeah, Williams. Kind of stuff, stuff. So, you know, put all that together and, you know, made for an interesting sound. It still does. How did Colin end up in, or why did Colin end up in the other guy just bailed? Yeah. Um, yeah, so around... Uh, you know, so we're doing like we, the most touring we ever did as a band was in 2003 when 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 we last put out pretest. We toured for like six months that year or something, and um, that was that was a lot. You know, we're starting to get a little bit burnout. Mm -hmm. um, tensions were happening with our bass player, and um, 
and then we, we, we agreed to do some more tours in early 2004 and, um, it was just getting more and more tense and he just seemed really unhappy, our bass player. Um, mm -hmm. It was kind of a mutual thing sometime in the, I can't remember when, kind of the middle of 2004. Yeah. Um, it, we kind of mutually parted ways and yeah, he, he kind of gave me my, his blessing to kind of, he's like, you can do whatever with the band, what you can do whatever with whatever with the songs we've written. Cause we were actually starting, we had had half an album written with him. Okay. And I really liked the material and I was really hoping like it wouldn't just get lost forever. And he was kind of, you can do whatever with the stuff we started writing together. Right. Paul was already a really good friend of ours and we knew he was an amazing musician. So. Was, was he a, is he a Philly guy? Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's like born in, raised in Philly. Okay. Yeah. So, and actually the second this Rubius show ever was with Collins. Like he was only like 16 at the time or something. It was like with his, with his like high, old high school band. Um, they, they were also on the bill. That's when we first, met was oh, you first met him there okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and we just kind of yeah stayed friends and everything so anyway he was the perfect replacement and and, and um yeah we were lucky because otherwise i don't know if we would have continued oh you think it might have disintegrated might have i mean i probably would have still kept playing with jeff the drummer but we might have called it something else called it something else yeah. yeah well um what's the bass player's the original bass player's name i don't want to uh, say uh, his, his name uh, his name's clayton Clayton, do you um do you have any contact with him or no so when he left the band um wow he just kind of cut off all communication not just with me but kind of with 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 everybody and wow he's really like uh falling off the off the map <laughs> yeah wow it's a shame yeah. yeah um so uh let's see what influence you said you were the metal guy well we kind of talked about that because we talked mm -hmm. about the 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 um was there anything particularly you as a guitarist were drawing in to do with, because you're doing a lot of, <laughs> you do a lot of shit. I'm not even sure what you're doing when I listen to it. It's so, you know, I hear a lot of tritones and dissonant chords and thing, you know, mm -hmm. so I clearly know that you're searching around, around on the guitar to come up with some of the most, you know, cause I actually hear some Holdsworthy and type stuff in there too. Mm -hmm. Not, not so much, you know, cause everybody knows Holdsworth. The least. The lead stuff, right. that, 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 that. Yeah. yeah, I mean that buttery, just floating thing that he did. But he also was a guy that would come up with. He watched his hands. It was Very like, mortal. Yeah. No, it was like bizarro what he was mm -hmm. doing. And to me, you know, I like a lot of guitar players better than Holdsworth, but I kind of mm -hmm. think like Holdsworth was on a plane of existence. Oh yeah, it's an alien, separate yeah. from anyone else. You yeah. know, he just was in. If we're all here on Earth, he's kind of out there in outer space somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've got his box set over here and I still, there's some stuff I'm like, man, I just don't like that. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, I, I, I have the same relationship with some of his music too. Yeah. He's definitely, there's players like him and I can name other names too. I don't even know if I should or, but, but there's, yeah, go there's, ahead. Nobody, there's, other, there's these other guitar players that I, I really um, love things about their techniques. Right. And, some of the the concepts and approaches they use but i just don't like the music they make that much right for whatever reason it's not like it's bad music it's just kind of just maybe the mood of it is just not like, yeah doesn't, doesn't speak to you yeah but like so holter's a good example like yeah i love his alien approach to chords and soloing but you know maybe some of the super fusiony 80s production is not like my aesthetic and then he got into the whole midi thing and that six yeah. thoughts oh yeah. man yeah, but I appreciate his like exploratory. Yeah, picture, you know, um, I agree. But yeah, my, to me, like some of my some of the coolest ways you can use influences is like being influenced by things that you would uh, you would just do your own way, not like they do it. Right. Like, you're kind of taking an idea from them, but you're kind of just twisting it around, doing it your own way. I think sometimes that can be a cooler way to use influences than just be like, I really love this player. I want to play just like them. And yeah. And then you do, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then you're just mimicking them. You're just essentially cloning your thing. And we all know that, you know, whenever, as guitarists, we know that, you know, the tones and things, they come from here and here. They're mm -hmm. not really, the, the, the instruments are tools. And it's nice to have really nice tools. There's no mm -hmm. question about that. But that the thing, the ideas are coming from here. And the execution, the sonic execution is coming from here. So, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I could never play like Holdsworth in a million years. I just, mm. I don't think the way he thinks. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anybody does. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. We said that, yeah. Um, so 
I couldn't get every single album in, but I did listen to Veil of Control and mm -hmm. Terminal Threshold. Mm -hmm. And the Veil, Veil's a little bit moodier. Yeah, yeah, that's a moody one. And mm -hmm. and and I think that threat term uh, yeah terminal thresholds, mm -hmm. it's kind of a thrash record. At yeah, thrash, thrash album. <laughs> it's like you're going all out, and mm -hmm. but it's got a lot of dissonance and atonal riffs in it. But there's there's also a lot of really beautiful crystalline mm -hmm. moments where you're layering things because you're yeah. a layer. You're a big time layer. I love layering guitars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, who if you play and you don't, there's don't get me wrong. I like guys mm -hmm. that can just do the just the guitar thing right yeah, yeah but i'm like you i want to hear those that weaving the fabric of the the something together to make something larger you know taking yeah. two things that are maybe even simple and playing a distant oh, yeah. Layer, layering simple ideas on top of each other that makes something right. more dense is uh, great yeah. yeah um so a lot of interesting musical influences that kind of shape shift a lot i'm reading what i'm wrote because mm -hmm. i'm old and i can't remember shit okay. um that that a lot into dissonance and angularity and complexity, but yet there's there's still the thing that that got me about this was because I had these two dysrhythmia dysrhythmia CDs that I was sent right before I moved and they mm -hmm. got buried and I just didn't get I didn't get to them and I'm like yeah I'm, I'm I don't know if I'm gonna like that I I don't know if I'm gonna like it like I've already got a predisposed thought which is mm -hmm. a terrible thing to do mm -hmm. but I'm like I don't know if I'm really gonna like that even though I like a lot of shit like Gore Guts and Despel Omega, and you know, although mm. I don't like the people in Despel Omega, or at least one of them, so I don't really partake of them anymore. Yeah. Um, but what I found was that through the distance and angularity and complexity, those songs on that album, the last one, Terminal mm. Threshold, mm. very musical yet. I mean, there's something, there's a lot of melody going on in there, and <laughs> right here, I can't. <laughs> Somehow mel melody is there. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. What's on the horizon for Disrhythmia? Are you guys working on something? Yeah, we are. Yeah, it's coming together. It's it's taking a little bit longer than usual. I mean, the pandemic had something to do with that, obviously. For sure. Um, I'm gonna lift my laptop up. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, but yeah, we have a uh, we have like uh, five five songs kind of finished as a whole band, and then two more that are right now are just guitar. Um, that we'll, we'll, the other guys will get to, um, get in into coming month. but yeah, it's almost like a full record. I feel like we just need to write one more song and we'll have a, a full album. I always feel like eight songs is kind of like a good, you know, it'll probably be another five. like 35, 30 minute record. You know, I feel like that's a good length for our music, you know, for an album. Um, yeah. And the new stuff is, it's different, you know, I mean, that's the challenge of kind of keeping, you know, this band has been around for a long time now, you know, so. 24 years almost yeah. yeah yeah so you know old, bro. <laughs> this is the ninth record ninth full length you know so you don't want to repeat yourself you know i feel like we have a sound that's definitely recognizable but um hopefully, oh, sure. not, hopefully it's not a sound that people are just like oh this again you know and and uh, the new stuff is definitely different i mean first off um pretty much everything is in standard e440 or a4 you know standard tuning yeah i could tell i i think i picked up a, i thought maybe it might be flat but i didn't really pick up oh, terminal threshold, threshold is, is is like lower tunings and alternate tunings but this, oh, you're saying the new one okay the new stuff i'm working on now is um yeah just standard tuning which i <laughs> hardly ever do you know so i thought it'd be interesting to actually write something in standard tuning um because it's actually it's a challenge for me um and um something different we're doing this time too is um I'm kind of writing more of the drum ideas this time. Um, okay. But our drummer Jeff, he, I mean, he's amazing. I, I I actually usually just prefer he. I love his creative contributions. You know, so most of my rather he just write his own parts. I love what he he does. But um, he. Um. Yeah, he kind of wanted me to kind of give him give him some ideas, but then of course I got very like, self indulgent with like yeah. okay. <laughs> these ideas, and they're they're kind of overly complicated. And we've been having to kind of like simplify a lot of them. What are you oh, using? What are you using for that? I've been, I've been using um Guitar Pro to write the drum parts. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was already using Guitar Pro to kind of tab out the guitar stuff. Um, I've right. been out these Disrhythmia tab books in the past couple of years, and I was so with the new materials. Like, let me just let me just tab it out right away, so I can just put out the book when it's done. And then as I was doing that, I was like, oh, I should try. I should try programming drum parts um, to these guitar riffs that I already have tabbed out in Guitar Pro. So I just mm -hmm. opened up the, the drum machine in Guitar Pro and, you know, just through just kind of typing musical notation, you know, you can play back your MIDI drums of what you just notated. And 
um, it's been a pretty fun way to work because I can already see what the time signatures are and what the rhythm of the guitar part is, and I can kind of build drum parts based off that. I can have a lot of fun. Using, with did you say you're using Pro Tools or you're using the Guitar no, so Pro? I, so I use Guitar Pro to, to, to program right. the MIDI drum ideas. Okay. And then um, usually what I do is I just let, then I re I kind of like I record like real guitar on top of the MIDI drums. Oh, MIDI and I, I also have it all scored out and I give that to Jeff and, and Colin, the bass player. And Colin Rice is, is on parts. Um, right, right, right. right. Kind of also kind of basically, he's just kind of interpreting, you know, some, some stuff he kind of sticks to like what I wrote. Um, mm -hmm. Other things, you know, he might have a better idea. You know, it's like best idea wins. I, I, I don't have any like. Sure. Uh, Are you, um, is your drummer local or where's he at? Yeah, he's in Queens too. He's not, he's not. Oh, far. he's in New York. Okay. Yeah. What about, and Colin's upstate New York or? No, he's, he's a 10 minute walk down the street. We're in the same Oh shit, neighborhood. no kidding. Yeah, yeah. You guys are neighbors. Wow. How about yeah, that? Yeah. Yep. So, so uh, the, the, uh, the, the man, what's it called? Ma Threnagroth? Uh, Threnagroth, a thousand caves. Yeah. Okay. So it's really just his bedroom. <laughs> An extra yeah. bedroom. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a big, it's a big uh, studio though. I mean, there's a lot of, uh. It's called the Thousand Caves for a reason. It's called. Oh, is it? okay. Always, yeah. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Um, let's see what I got here on that. We'll get moving on pretty quickly. But I, uh, one thing I wanted to say was, what I came away from listening to both those albums, and like I said, Veil's a little bit darker, yeah. moodier album. It's not quite as heavy metal, I would say. It's a little yeah. more denser too, in a little totally. way. Um, yeah. um I, I came away from that going, ah. This guy's going to start costing me a bunch of money. You'll hear that again. So yeah. <laughs> um, let's transition to Gorgots because I think in the, the scheme of trying to stay linear at some point, would that be the next thing or or was there? Kind of. Actually, it's funny because I always think Sabbath of Sabbath assembly in there. It's funny because I always think of Gorgas as kind of being this like later thing, but it, it actually isn't because like this really oh, nine. Yeah, this rhythm. Uh, yeah, this rhythm was kind of my my kind of only or just like main thing for like a long time. And then actually, it was two thousand eight. I guess technically was when I remember it was like late two thousand eight was when Luke sent the first demo, like song idea for mm -hmm. for, for guts. You know, um, and two thousand nine was the first time we all actually met in person. And oh, okay. Right together. Um, so yeah, how did that, 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 that all come that about? Was, was after how that all come about with Luke? How did he did he know about you from Dysrhythmia? Did he hear from some so, friend or? Um, yeah, so um, he already knew um, John Longstreth. We chose right. to play drums. Origin. Yeah, they were already communicating already even before the idea, even before Luke had the idea that to re re-erect the band. Um, right. Colin, he um, had met because Colin went up to Montreal to see Negativa, actually. Um, the the his project was, was Hurdle. Yeah, yeah. And so they had already met. Um, and then Luke wasn't aware of Disrimia or me or anything. It was it was Steve Hurdle who showed him Disrimia on YouTube and said, you know, check out the, the guitar player in this band. He also plays with this guy, Colin, that you also happen to want to be in your band as well. So right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those, these two guys are already playing music together. Might as well get them both at the same time. So, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So he just said, "It's funny." He sent us a MySpace message, and I, a MySpace. Oh God! Message. And I remember we were, just really was on tour at the time when, when I got the message. I remember like checking my email. We were crashing at some kid's house. I say some kid. Actually, this was um, Dylan from Bellwitch, if you know that band. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But back then, you know, he was just this kid living in yeah. Lawrence that would, that would kind of like right. Put it like let us crash at his house, but I remember, yeah, we were at his house and and uh, I was checking my email and I saw this message from Luke and I, I like, I, I'm pretty sure I ran <laughs> downstairs. I was like, Colin, dude, dude, check this out. And then Colin showed you his message, right? No, no. It's funny because Colin wasn't on MySpace, so I think I still don't know. I should ask. Him. I still don't, I don't know if Colin ever got a message. I mean, he must have, but maybe it wasn't MySpace. I don't think Colin was on MySpace. I don't know. I might be wrong. I, I, I all I know is I got the message first. And I showed okay. Colin, and we were both like, "Is this for real?" You know? Yeah, like, right. Yeah, but you were you were already aware, well aware of Gorguts then. Yeah, and it's funny. It's like I had actually had written Luke on MySpace. Um, okay. I think two years before he wrote me, and he never wrote back. But um, he had like a page up for like his classical music or something. Oh, okay. That he was uh, his string pieces or something he was writing, and I wrote to him. and I was like, "That's so cool! You're writing classical music, you know." But and then I never heard back, and 
You're like, oh man, those guys are he, he's a dick. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I just kind of thought like he probably doesn't go online much, but um, um you yeah. bring up MySpace. That's that's pretty hilarious. All right, we don't have to talk about MySpace. <laughs> Jesus Christ, was that the worst platform ever? <laughs> I mean, I get it. It was the precursor of Facebook and all that mm. stuff, but man, it's just blah. somewhere out there. There still are MySpace pages in some, co- you know, drift in some servers somewhere. Yeah, yeah. But um, that's okay. So you get that message from him and. You hit him back, I assume, or did he give his phone number? Or oh, what? yeah, right away. I was like, you know, we're we're interested, you know. And um, yeah, I think I gave him my <clears throat> my email address. And it's like, you know, this is this is the better way to reach me. And um, yeah, I remember he started, you know, started sending songs. Like a few months later, you know, started getting MP3s of of so- they weren't even just song ideas. I mean, they were like complete. They, they were basically complete compositions. Songs. Yeah. It was just just his guitar and a click track, but it was like pretty much like here's the structure of the song, and the, the, I, I love working this way. Like Luke presents a song, and it's like super solid, you know, like mm-hmm. like just the the arrangement and like the order of riffs and structure, and all I got to do is just kind of like layer my thing on top of it, and it, it's a super fun way to work, you know. Um, Did you guys play it all live with Gorguts before you actually recorded Color Sands? We did play some of the songs live. Yeah, we did like a, a we did like it wasn't even a tour. It was just like we played MDF in 2010, and we did some shows around it. And we, we right. played some um, instrumental versions of stuff from Covered Sound. Okay, okay. I thought so. I wasn't sure, but I thought that <laughs> I had heard that or read that somewhere. So yeah. there was a little pre. So that was in gestation for quite a long time. Then that that album. Yeah. Um, yeah, like the first song for it was uh, yeah written in two thousand eight or something, and then we finally recorded it in two thousand eleven, and then it didn't come out to two thousand thirteen. So it was a long time in the making, kind of. This is a question off my script here. To, uh-huh. Just occurred to me. I mean, was was it? Um, how long word this? Was was it a little uh, anxiety inducing knowing you had to? come in there and follow guys like Dan Mongrain yeah. Oh, yeah, and, Monster and Steve Hurdle and oh yeah these guys are all top shelf of mine uh, yeah and players that I really admire and don't right. want to disrespect in any way you know so yeah I felt I don't know but I, I try not to think too much about it you know I was just happy I, honestly, I was just ha- I was just really happy to be part of it that's all that's kind of all I was thinking about. I was like let me just relax and just have fun with this and if Luke's happy, I'm happy, you know. So he's he sending stuff back and forth, and then you went up in 09. Did you go up to his place or? Um, most yeah. Occasionally we go up. Wait, okay. So this is when John was still in the band. So actually, Luke and John would. John was living in Albany at the time, or Saratoga Springs, or somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. Luke would usually um drive down from, you know, near. He doesn't live in Montreal, but he's kind of outside Montreal. He, right, he would right, drive right. Down from from Canada to long trust place and crash with him in Albany. And then the two of them come, would come the rest of the way to Whithaven where we are in Queens. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, we, we rehearsed at Colin studio here um, for color sands. Oh, you did. Okay. All right. And then did you do your, I mean, he had the demos sketched out already. Did you end up doing. So we did, we did pre-production demos, which Colin put on YouTube um, last year or something. Oh, really? Yeah, they sound pretty good. Yeah, you know? check those out. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, we did like pretty uh, not for every single song in Color Sands, but I think for like six out of the eight or something or five. I can't remember. I is think there five, anything out? Is there anything out there we don't know about that didn't get used? It's, no, no, no. Um, no, there's no leftover songs. Right okay. Um, yeah, he strikes me as a guy that's very deliberate with what he wants to accomplish. <clears throat> yeah, um, we do throw out. There are riffs that have been here and there kind of thrown out, you know, like they didn't get very far kind of thing, but. Well, you know, I guess what I was thinking of, and are you much of a Jethro Tull fan? No, nah, I mean, I just don't know their catalog that well. I just, I just know Aqualong. The well, song. they do, they do these. I'm going to give away one of my things if we do that album thing at the end, but uh, they do these, these books. Uh, what I'm going to do is show you quick. You uh, can't see it quick, but it's like a book, right? A hardbound mm, book. Mm. All their 40th anniversaries are now 50 actually. Mm. have been redone they're up through i think they're about ready to drop broadsword and the beast but anyway you know and i i'm a tall fanatic and mm. what's crazy about it is the amount of fucking material that ian anderson he, just a machine man mm. i mean 
writing song, and most of them are incredibly good songs. Mm-hmm. So you get these these 40th anniversary editions, and there's 12 extra checks. There's a whole mm-hmm. other album there that was wasn't even used. <clears throat> yeah, and you're like, who does it? Like, for example, as being a Monster Rush fan, mm-hmm. when the 40th anniversary box sets of them started coming out, there's virtually there's nothing. There's right. no working demo versions of this. They sat down and constructed songs. And that was it. When they had the album, they were done. You know, yeah, yeah. sounds like loose kind of that way too. Yeah, there's not a lot of extra material. I mean, it takes us long enough just to get, you know, a song kind of like arranged right. and together and rehearsed enough to be satisfied with. Yeah. You know, so same thing with dysrhythmia. There's never any extra dysrhythmia stuff. It takes us so long just to. Yeah, you're trying to get everything to fit the pieces of the puzzle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Since Luke isn't a prolific band in terms of pumping out albums, mm. I suppose this was kind of a perfect thing for you because to, you're playing complex mu- music, but you it doesn't completely overtake your life and you can do mm. your other projects on the side, right? So you don't have to divide your time. Do yeah. you wish there was more activity in the camp with, with Core Guts? Or, oh. and I'm not trying to get you in trouble with Luke, but I'm going to ask the question right now. No, you know Luke, Luke is a... He's very re- super respectful of like me and Colin's schedules and other mm-hmm. things we do outside the band, and he kind of never wants Gorguts to kind of take over. Take over, you know. But 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 we're such big fans of the band still, even though we're part of it. You know that that we're most of the time we're willing to kind of just drop what we're doing and be like, right, or let's do it. You know, want to write songs? Well, you guys are doing Decibel Fest in April. Yeah, yeah. And that's that was big fucking news because I'm. With my medical situation, it's going to shows is not easy for me. So, but mm-hmm. I'm like going, man, if I'm still here, I got to try to make an effort because it's not just you guys. It's incantation. It's mm-hmm. worm. It's uh, phobophilic. It's, you know, there's, there's a lot of killer bands, the undercard bands to me. Mm-hmm. I don't mind saying it. I, suicidal was great once. They may still be great. They may still mm-hmm. kick ass. I, I'm sure Mike is yeah. still kicking ass. But it's, I, I could give or take that. And I, who's the other one? Black Dahlia? Mm. Yeah, I think they're playing today. We are. Brandon's an amazing guitar player. I'm just not really into their style of metal so mm. much. But I know they're good. But mm. So I'm going to try and make it down. But I guess the obvious question is, what's is anything going on that you can talk about? You mean as far as like another record or something? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, all I can say is um, we all want to do one. Um I think I think we're you know we're gonna have our first rehearsal for this April show next weekend. Okay. Patrice, you know Patrice is the now. Yep, drummer. Yep, killer drummer. Yeah, killer amazing. drummer. Amazing! I can't wait to play with him. I have, we haven't played together in six years. Yeah. Oh, that dude is so good. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, he was in uh, Martyr, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I always forget that because I'm a big I'm a big Martyr fan. I was oh. I'm playing with the drummer for Martyr. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Dan was my technically Dan was my first interview when I decided I wanted yeah. to start doing this. Now, we didn't do we did 50 minutes as opposed mm-hmm. to because as you can tell by my style of interviewing, I, it's very relatable. I want to talk about you and get into and how this stuff affects me and how it affects mm-hmm. you. And, you know, we're at an hour now. So, I mean, are you still good for a while? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. OK, um, but. Dan, I don't. He had another one scheduled, and he was up against it. But uh, I had him laughing his ass off because mm-hmm. I was doing, uh, I was doing snake impressions. Uh-huh. I do a great. I, I, I do. It had to be good. I just kept doing the the, the Canadian, French Canadian thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But what a great guy! Mm-hmm. What a fucking guitar player, man. Like, yeah, yeah. talk about Holdsworth. Like, come on, dude. Like, sick. And without him, you, I. Most people say it. I believe it one hundred percent. Without him, I mean, there was just not going to be a boy body anymore. There was right, nobody. Right. You're a great guitar player, but I don't know if that would be your gig. I just, it's... I mean, that's funny because, like, I mean, I love Voivod. I mean, they're probably. Oh, it's hard to pick a favorite band. I used to think I had a favorite band, but as I get older, it's like no, there's like five. You get overwhelmed with it, yeah. There's oh, Voivod is there. definitely like some days they're my favorite band ever. I mean, I, I love it. Oh, yeah, but I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know if I could. Like Dan's dedication to playing everything exactly like piggy did and even like getting the exact same guitar tones i also yep. don't know if i would have that discipline you know yep. and, and then of course the, the material the new stuff is fucking, oh, it's fucking yeah, amazing he's the perfect guy for that man yeah he, he really was and not it, we're not making it about dan but he's just and he's just such a sweetheart of a guy just such a mm-hmm. good dude yeah um and then and then you know the martyr stuff 
man. <laughs> yeah. I just, uh, anyway, so moving on. We'll, we'll... Uh, yeah, but uh, getting back to the new stuff, like, so anyway, I think I, I'm hoping that, like, you're just playing together again is going to, you know, I think it, I know Luke's really excited, you know, the play. In other words, Luke's had to tell you, hey, I got these riffs. I got. I'm, no, I'm it takes some, it takes some time, you know, he, he, everyone's different, you know, as far as like when they feel ready to like work on music again, you know, um, people like me and Colin are kind of always. You're doing it. Yeah. I mean, but the thing is like Gorgas has always been like sort of like Luke's, he just has that one outlet pretty much besides maybe yeah. like some of his classical music he does on the side. Whereas like me and Colin, especially Colin, you know, we all have these a million other things going on on, yeah yeah so it's like we're always working on music in some capacity but um anyway i think i think the break's been good i think luke's totally re-inspired um we're super ready and inspired to work on new stuff again so that that's the plan you know after we get this show done is this the only show for now yeah okay yeah um Um, colored sands it's such an incredibly dense and brutal record but it also has some very delicate and beautiful moments throughout. What are your memories of recording it? Um, you kind of talked about, you may have already answered this. Did you do any, did you do any tracking together at, over at Collins? Uh, so yeah, the Collins, Collins Dance was like, there's quite a st- story behind the making of that record. I mean, it was kind of a big. Am I going into it a little bit? I could a little bit. Yeah. I won't bore you with like every little detail, but like, okay. um, whew, uh, well, we, you know, so we, we booked time up in, Canada and like deep in the woods of Quebec, mm-hmm. way up north, um, with um, Pierre at Wild Studios. He, he had done the Martyr records, he did Obscura from Wisdom the Hate, too. I think. So, he the guy did the recent Voivod, right? I don't know, actually. What's his last name? Uh, I can't pronounce it. It's like a French last like name, like Robert or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's an R. I'll yeah, I think that's the dude that, that did the last two um, Voivods. So, go ahead. Um, anyway, we went up to his studio. It's called Wild Studios, and um, in, in in early February, in in you know, in, uh, in the north of Canada, and so oh, it, the weather was insane. Um, yeah. It was like, but his studio was beautiful. It had these huge, uh, huge windows. Like everything was kind of like these big glass windows. It was right on a lake, but like the lake was frozen and covered in snow, and there was like mountains. And we were actually kind of snowed in for some of the time there. Like we couldn't even really leave. Jeez, if I didn't know any better, I'd think you were talking about Le Studio. Uh, where Rush recorded? One that Rush recorded at, yeah, I like the that. Video for, the video for Limelight, I I, I remember yeah. watching that being like, that looks like where we recorded yeah. Lance. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. That, sadly, that's gone, but yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so the studio was beautiful, and yeah, we tracked um, Yeah, we tracked it all together, you know, kind of played through the songs live, but, you know, the guitars were kind of, and the bass, I guess, was just kind of considered a scratch, and we only kept the drums. Um, Luke and I, yeah, did our guitars. Colin did bass last. Colin did his bass tracks, like the bass on that record, man. He he blasted through that. Like most of those are like one take. Wow. He did like all his bass in two hours for that record. Yeah, he's so it was amazing. He, but also he was like he was the last one to kind of um. It's weird because usually you would do kind of maybe bass after drums and then the guitars last. But mm-hmm. for whatever reason, we did the bass last, and I remember he was just so antsy to just get his bass tracked and and um. He, he recorded his bass down in where his amp was, which was like down in like the basement. I, I never even saw what it looked like down there, but apparently there was like rocks and water and <laughs> it wasn't like the beautiful scenery of where the live mm-hmm. room was. Mm-hmm. Um, so we did all that. By the way, by the way Coop, mm-hmm. Coop, Coop, Coop Rest Records, do you know uh, that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. He says Pierre Remillard. That's that's Yeah, that's that's, that's right. Yeah. He did Target, Target Earth, guitarist in uh, Oblivion. Oblivion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really sweet okay, guy. Right. We liked working with him. Yeah. Um, so then we did all the basic tracking there. I think I even did a couple of the guitar solos there. Um, okay. Out of all of them, and then um, you know, at, the, at that time we were kind of weren't didn't really have a record label or like we were kind of like in conflict with yeah this li- the label that was supposed to put it out or I don't know I wasn't involved in any of the business but the record got held up for like two years you know um, really. Yeah, like it was, I was like it's hanging in this unfinished state for quite a while, and then um, yeah, we just kind of finished the rest of the record. Pierre ended up getting too busy, I guess, just didn't have the time, and you know, well, we're just like, well, Colin, he said he has an amazing studio, he's an amazing, amazing recording engineer. Let's just finish it. Yeah, Colin, you know, so I recorded the rest of my guitar stuff there, and Luke did all his vocals there. We did the string piece 
there in Colin's studio. Colin oh, okay, right, right, right. Mastered it. Yeah. So. And uh, that was um, that came out on seasons, right? Season, season of Mist, yeah. Yeah, and and uh, now was that just a one album deal, or is does he still do another album with them? Or does uh, he did one more record maybe with them? I think it was a three album deal. Maybe. Okay, so Pleiades was second, and yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see what else I have on that. That's that's really cool. Uh, la, 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 la. I'm just trying to get to. Oh, you have one track on that album, Absconders, which mm -hmm. is the longest track. I think it's probably the most aggressively proggy, other than maybe uh, I can't pronounce the French Le Tout, whatever. Oh, the, Monde, the first yeah, one, the yeah. Um, and um, I guess what I wanted to ask there was, let me see what I wanted to ask there. I'm sorry. I kind of lost my track of where I was at. Where'd it go? Oh, yeah. Um, it's proggy, but it's super incredibly dissonant, too. And it's got that dysrhythmia thing going on. Was Luke encouraging you and Colin to be involved in the writing right from the start? No, um, I wouldn't say right from the start. I think... Um... You know, I think I think at first, you know, it was obvious that we were going to work on the material he already had. And right. He already had like, yeah, at least three songs. Um, so, yeah, I think once we got like five songs done, you know, that Luke had presented to us. Um, right. I I remember for Absconders, I I I don't think he asked me to write a song necessarily. I think I think I just had that riff. I was going to say, was that something you had sort of sitting around? And you wanted... I, I remember writing that song. It wasn't for Gorgas. It wasn't for anything. I was just sitting on Jamming. my couch yeah. and I just picked up my guitar with no plan to write anything. And I just, I wrote that opening riff and I was like, that's cool. And then I was like, oh, now I hear it slowing down into this doomy thing. And I'm playing it. And I'm like, this kind of has this like doomy, morbid angel vibe to it. I'm like, this. Yeah. I was yeah. like, I don't think this should be an instrumental song. So this shouldn't be a Disrhythmia song. And I was like, oh, I should ask Luke if if he wants to hear this idea for Gorguts, you know, and, and I think that's how it went. I think I wrote to him. I was like, look, I have these riffs that I think could be a Gorguts song. And he was like, send it to me. And then he liked it. And, and then maybe that's after cool. that, then, he asked, then, he, then I think, I think he asked Colin to write a song. And I think for me, it was more like, I just kind of approached him. I was like, I have some riffs. Do you like this? Okay. That's right. how it went. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess it's hard to tell yet where you're at because you haven't really talked about doing a new album, but do you think, I mean, he seems like such a gracious, good guy that I, I can't imagine him going, Hey, it's my thing. Get, get the fuck away from me here. I can't imagine that if he doesn't hear a good idea, he's not going to say, let's do it. You know? I think he likes to, you know, sort of set the direction and have the concept in place first, you know? Right. So I think for the new stuff, you know, it's obvious we're going to kind of wait for him to kind of like initiate Get started. Right. Yeah. You know, the direction. But I mean, you know, hurdle wrote almost, a huge par portion of uh, Obscura. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so I don't. Think, yeah, I don't think it's 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 not. It doesn't seem like it's in his nature. You know, there's some people like, well, Stephen Wilson for mm -hmm. Porcupine Tree. You know, he wrote eighty five, well, ninety five percent of everything, and then he yeah. proposed. You know, he'd pretty much give those guys full demos. I'm going to be talking to Colin tomorrow about it. Not yeah. your Colin, but mm -hmm. Colin Evan, and. You know, I said to him, like, when, when I first met those guys back in the 99, which would have been Stupid Dream, I said, you know, what, what you know, what's like working with Steve? Well, he's kind of like a benevolent dictator. <laughs> and, you know, I don't I don't I, I don't see Luke being that way so much. I don't. No, no, he's not at all. Luke's a, Luke's a sweetheart. He's the, I mean, he's the best collaborator. You could ask. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I ask you about that. What do you do? Any different string gauge when you're doing uh, Gorguts? Yeah, so I use um, pretty heavy strings for the C, you know, the C Sander stuff. Absconders, the song we were just talking about, that's one of those songs that's in like a totally different alternate tuning. It's a really low. What is it? Can you tell me just out of curiosity? Or do you not want to remember? Yeah, it's a uh, from low E to high E. It's a mm -hmm. A sharp. Oh. F, A sharp, F. A sharp, D sharp. So ah, it's, so it's of, almost like it's almost like a like an open tuning in a weird I, way. I, well, yeah, it has like a yeah. There's like three A sharps and two mm -hmm. F. It's kind of this droney tuning. I, I tend to have a lot of alternate tunings that are like Drone. droney, but then the stuff I'm writing with it doesn't sound droney. But are you much of a fan of uh, Nick Drake at all? Oh yeah, I love Nick Drake. Yeah, I mean, the dude was like doing these bizarro tunings. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, it's definitely. I was super influenced by. 
people, yeah, like those acoustic players that use alternate tunings, like him and Michael. Well, Hill, all these people. And Lindsey Buckingham. I mean, he was doing drop D way before any Seattle bands were doing drop D. You know, a lot of the folk players played. Commas, you probably know Commas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, was kind of doing that crazy shit too. So, um, Play These Dust comes out three years after Colored Sands, and you did a fair bit of touring for that, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Any specific memories from recording that and the tours that followed? Did and then did you have any footprint on the writing of that, or was that all Luke's thing? No, Blades Dust was you know just like Colored Sands in a way. It was kind of like Luke presented the blueprint, kind of like this foundation. Um, it wasn't the whole you know that that's like a thirty something minute song. The first uh, when we worked on that album, uh, we had the first twenty minutes of it, kind of initially. That was kind of what we worked on first and then Luke didn't have, you know, we knew the song wasn't finished, but Luke didn't have the rest. So the last 10 minutes kind of after all the ambient stuff, I guess, in the track. Um, but was that mostly Colin or that pulled that together? Uh, that Colin, really I guess, uh, yeah, I guess Colin kind of wrote, I guess maybe there's that a lot of bass ambience going on. Yeah. 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 I think that part, like, I guess you could say Colin maybe wrote that part of it, but anyway, the rest, like all the riffs and the, foundation of the song was was Luke but yeah the last 10 minutes of it was kind of written after we already kind of like finished the first 20 minutes of it mm -hmm. but um uh yeah you know it was another one of the things where like he sends us a demo and he's like um do you like this you know you want to write some stuff on top of it and I'm like fill yeah. in the holes sort of thing yeah yeah and um he also usually will send tabs <clears throat> to me of, of what his parts are um and even though I know I'm not going to really most of the time play what he's playing, um, I still like to kind of um, see what he what he's yeah. playing because um, it gives me ideas of like, oh, he's playing that chord. I could I could do this kind of harmony on top of it. Or mm -hmm. um, a lot of times though, I'm not thinking so much about theory or anything. I'm just kind of using. I a lot of times I, I just try to use my ear use first. Ear. And then if I start getting frustrated in, in kind of just using my ears and working, then I'll maybe I'll take the time to look at like, oh, that's what he's playing. Okay, and then I'll get it an idea see i i hate guys like you and here's why <laughs> I, I it's all ear with me i've mm -hmm. tried to learn re, my kid is a great guitar player mm -hmm. amazing sight reader and it's just like he's tried he's tried over and over to get me to understand i just i can't i don't it's like trying to learn japanese now for me it's like too it's too um what's the word i'm looking for um as an ADHD guy, it's uh, too, I can't focus on it long. Well, I, I totally get that. I mean, it, you know, I think for me, I I learned music theory like at the right time, early on, and, and it's funny because I actually I was I was just home for the holidays at my parents' house, and I was kind of um, trying to clean up just <laughs> my room and, and just kind of get stuff out of my parents' way that was sitting around forever. So I was going through some drawers, and I found my old like music theory class notebooks from high school. Uh -huh. I was looking through. I was like, I don't remember, man. I mean, I I know I teach a lot of music theory in my guitar lessons and stuff, but mm -hmm. there's so much music theory that I used to know that I, I totally have forgotten about. I mean, it's stuff that kind of I don't really apply to guitar very much, so that's why I kind of have forgotten. Well, you're about more it. of an intuitive player now, right? Yeah, yeah. And I don't yeah. think you need to know all that music theory to make interesting music or be a great player, obviously. But um, it was just interesting for me to to look back on these tests that I used to take and I did yeah. really well on them. And I'm like, I couldn't answer. Any I couldn't pass this thing now at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, anyway, go back to Play These Dust. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, recording it, we did it with Colin. Um, it went really smoothly. I mean, we recorded that, like at least the, the basic drums and the rhythm section stuff we did like really quick. Again, Patrice and Colin are just freaking amazing. Yeah. And just nailed their shit. Like, really quickly me and luke kind of again we went back and kind of re-recorded a lot of the guitars just right. because we were very particular about having lots of different guitar tones and, mm -hmm. and using like different guitars on different sections oh, you can definitely hear that it's a very um well again the layered thing is there but mm -hmm. it's it's not so layered that you can't reproduce it live but you can tell there's a lot of thought going on about how you're weaving your guitar lines together and and, and things like that and it's I can't remember whether I ranked that my favorite album or not. I'm trying to remember. I think, yeah, I think I did. I think it just edges out um, from Wisdom, which has Dan on it, because I love yeah. that album. And yeah. Erosion's a monster, too. Obscure is its own animal. It's in its own universe. And I, I need to hear it every couple of years. I can't listen to it, like, constantly. So you're tell me real quick, what's the prep for that? Have you been listening to that a lot lately? Well, yeah, since we have to, you know, 
learn songs from that record, um, ones that we've never played live before. I've been, yeah, I've been going back and and um, listening to, yeah, Obscure again. It's funny because I, I haven't really listened to any any Gorgas records that much since I've joined the band, other than to kind of like <laughs> practice along with a song that I have. Well, to yeah, because you're playing them, you know. It's like right, you know, even though I love those albums, it's like well, now I'm playing these songs, so I don't need to listen to the record, you know. But um, but it was interesting to go back and listen to Obscura again recently because I I'd was, forgot. What were your thoughts on it? Like just off the cuff, what's your thoughts? Um, well, you know, uh, it's just like a really terrifying album. Like, like that's on clouded. It's just one of the most it, yeah. horrific pieces of music ever. I love that song. I don't think we'll ever play it live. It's a clouded. Oh, you know, clouded is just song. that's a mind fuck of a song. Honestly, uh, Absconders was was my sort of like in my mind. I think I was like, oh, you're clouded. This is my clouded. <laughs> All right. So, what is Obscura? What's the tunings for that? That's just C standard. Um, and the interesting thing about, oh, about on, for real, that's yeah. just what? Yeah, the and it, the, the the funny thing about learning um, the songs from Obscura is uh, uh, it's uh, they're actually not there's not a lot of parts in those songs really. Um, the the riffs are just so weird and quirky, and then the drumming's so crazy. That's true. You know, that's what makes it sound so. Yeah. The technical and weird, but off the honestly, chain. for me as a guitar player, I find playing stuff from a version of Sandy way harder than Obscura. That's mm -hmm. when Luke leveled up to another place. He just mm -hmm. went somewhere different. And I forget what was the other guitar player. Was that the original guy on Consider Dead? Yeah, I think that the same guy on Consider Dead played on Erosion too. Yeah, I can't so remember his Sylvian. name. Yeah, Stephen, something like that. Or like Sylvian. Sylvian, that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, terrifying is a great word to put it because, you know, if I and if I talk to Luke, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna shy away from saying it's it's a hard record for a lot of people. I mean, honestly, for me, when I first bought that album, you know, it was way before I joined the band. But I hated it, right? <laughs> um, I didn't hate it. I, I actually I loved it, but I couldn't listen to it all the way through. All the way I, through. I listened up to. Um, uh, after clouded i would stop the record Dude, that's exactly what i did i it got the clouded. Much. i'm like man yeah. i need a break you know yeah yeah it was like too much um but i loved it you know yeah I, I would just kind of listen to the first half you know for like weeks in a row and then right. I, okay let's check out the second half of this i would treat it like two different albums yeah there was so much to kind of take in that's funny because you know before i got it i remember reading a lot of reviews of it and i'm like oh come on man yeah okay so these these you know music journos they're coming up with all these you know groundbreaking uh i'm trying to think um genre defying blah 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 and i'm like come on man man metal is metal you know yeah there's some that's darker and some that's faster and all that and i, and I put that on i'm like i got the clouded i got two after clouded i'm like I, I can't go any further with with this right now i i didn't go back and re-listen i did finish it mm -hmm. But then it was a it was a while before I came back to it and started to go okay, I, I can actually listen to this the whole way through. Uh -huh. I do think it gets weaker towards the end. I do honestly think it's uh -huh. it's front loaded from clouded on up. But then uh -huh. it, there's one or two songs that are good towards the end. But well, you saw the I don't know if you saw that if you got that far. But uh -huh. you know we go into that album pretty pretty in depth. And uh -huh. um, but um, so. You're looking forward to that, I guess. That's going to be pretty cool. Um, writing the new stuff, or oh, you mean playing the, yeah, you know, playing the obscure stuff? Yeah, and actually, in the you know the other half of the set's going to be considered dead stuff, and yeah, that's been fun. The you know, um, dude, that's a great guitar, guitar tone album, man. The guitar tones on that album are fucking sick, man. My only issue with it is it's a little, a little samey. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Like a lot of the songs, uh, yeah, a lot of the riffs start to kind of seem similar. Yeah, yeah. which is you could. Point that finger at a lot of death metal bands of that year, that that time. Um, let's get into some of these other things, and mm -hmm. uh, I'll try to move a little quicker here for you. Vara, mm -hmm. um, oh man, I, I well, we started to talk about this before, and and I'm just here's what I wrote. Mm -hmm. What's it called again? Something of a deviant, uh, a vista of deviant. A yeah. vista. I I have vista there. I don't know. I typos. A vista of deviant anatomies, which came out, in, I believe, January of twenty two. Yeah, last year. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's like an evil, twisted, late period Japan or David Sylvian album on mm -hmm. tons of acid and mushrooms 
It's a b- bizarre mixture of pulsing noise, industrial weird- weirdness, a la Andrew Lyles. I don't know if you know who that is. Mm-hmm. Um, mixed found sound manipulator. Uh, uh, mixed to end to completely disorient. Uh, yeah. Noise and industrial weirdness, a la Andrew Lyles, mixed into completely disorient. Yeah. I hear Scott Walker. I hear David Sylvian a lot. I hear mm-hmm. Wayne Hussey from the Mission UK. In his vocals, I hear Sisters of Mercy, I hear Japan, I hear Nurse with Wound. This album really fucked my world up for 49 minutes, and I'm not kidding when I say that. Josh's voice is an eerie mix of Wayne Hussey, Peter Murphy, David Sylvian, just haunting, hauntingly terrifying in a good way. The music is unpredictable. At times, it point at points, it borders on a maniacal rain tree crow gone industrial by way of skinny puppy. Hmm. Truly, truly a mar- remarkable album, but not for the faint of heart or those who have are not adventurous in their musical taste. This is honestly a boundary pushing work of art, Kevin. The the white cocoons, one of the most bizarre but interesting pieces yeah. of music I've ever heard. Um, so, what do you think? What do you think of my assessment of that? Oh, that's a, that's incredible to hear because really nobody's talked about that record <laughs> i mean we put it out ourselves it went you know i mean some people bought it on Bandcamp. it's i don't think it's gotten i think it got like one review you know so it's, it's interesting to hear your feedback on it because i feel like i haven't heard much feedback on the record but do you I, hear do you hear anything i said yeah, I mean, everything you said is is really on point like the 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 influences that you were mentioning um are pretty pretty on point i would say like those are definitely like things we were what's his name inspired. Uh, what's the guy's name the lead guy uh josh strong josh yeah I mean, it was uncanny. The moment I heard his voice, because mm-hmm. I'm a huge Japan guy. Yeah. Um, I love, you know, I'm friends with Richard Barbieri. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. Is Sylvian on this record? Like, right away. I had to look. I'm like, that's fucking crazy. And then there's a little bit of a Peter Murphy, Bauhausian mm-hmm. thing there, too. And then, so how this ties in with you. First of all, is this is an ongoing project. Has it ever played live? Yeah, but not in a long time. I don't think we've played a show in almost ten years. It's just it's sad, kind of. Um, how'd that come? How'd that come together quickly? Um. So yeah, I met Josh first. You know, we kind of I guess we kind of formed a band together. But Josh kind of already had a bunch of songs already written. So like, I think he was kind of already looking for people, and then I was kind of the first one. He started really talking to about it, and then we kind of put the rest of the band together. Um. Yeah, I met Josh at a show. You know, mutual friend introduced us. Um. Yeah, we just started talking about music right away, just music we liked. Um, I realized when I started talking to him that I had already seen him perform with his kind of like post-punk band called Blacklist. Oh, okay. I'm a big fan of the Chameleons, that band. Oh, don't fall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. What's a flip script of the bridge? No. Script on the bridge. Or script dude, on the bridge. dude yeah. one of my favorite albums of all time. Me too. I mean, they're, they're incredible. And, and um I discovered them kind of kind of late, I guess, like around 2008 or nine or something. And uh, Mark Burgess was doing like a uh, kind of just like a solo tour. I think he was like just finding different musicians in each town to like back, be his backing band. And no anyway, he played the show in Brooklyn, and and um, I was just getting super into Chameleons around that time. I was like, I gotta go to this show because I yeah. can worship Chameleons right now. And uh, anyway, so Josh is. Um, band one of his other bands was was opening the show and i remember watching him thinking like yeah they're good like this guy's a really good singer and but never thought much about like yeah meeting him or talking to him after the show or anything and then so yeah only a few weeks later i, I get introduced to him and i'm like oh i actually I, i've seen you perform you know? you play, yeah. and i was like oh you must like chameleons so we started talking about chameleons first then we started talking about like uh jakey lee ozzy records you know and i was like wait you like chameleons and you like mark at the moon and you like, uh, you know, black metal and prog. It's marriage, man. And I, and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then he was, you know, and then he was like, I got, I got these songs that I kind of don't know what to do with. Um, can I send them to you and just see? You know, he didn't wasn't really even asking me to like join the band or anything. He's like, can you just check them out? Check them out and see, you know, can you tell what me you think? Yeah. if you like them? And I'm like, oh yeah, sure, okay. And I was like, I really didn't think I didn't have any expectations really, you know. Um, and I remember him sending me the songs, and I was like, I'll check this out. And I listened to him, I was like, oh man, he's a really good. That's funny. He's a really good singer, and I was like, "These songs are awesome. Like, what's he want to do with these songs?" Yeah. And so I wrote them, and then yeah, you know, I was like, "Let's." I was like, "Man, I could hear some additional guitar layer. I have ideas like that I could add to these songs." He's like, "Cool." And so, yeah, we decided to form a band, and I brought in Toby Driver on bass, and he brought in Charlie, the drummer. 
Yeah, and Toby's uh, modeling it well, right? Right. So, yeah. The, they're, like, they're Philly or – no, they're Baltimore, right? Uh, they were ba originally based in Boston, I believe. But Toby's a Connecticut guy, but um, – Okay. Originally, but um, – anyway, so Toby's a friend of mine. I've always loved his playing and him as – you know, I love – Toby's a good friend of mine. So I thought it would be really cool to bring Toby into the project. And he's added a lot of spectacular – contributions to oh, you know, really write, album, really yeah. write songs for the band but like his his contributions like arrangement ideas and production ideas and his bass stuff that he adds is like amazing so yeah i gotta say man i mean we know gore guts and dysrhythmia no disrespect to those two projects because they're right. your big projects but anybody that's watching here the takeaway from today if you, you're gonna hear me I've got a couple more to get through quick kevin's man i mean there's just it blew my mind what you're doing, dude. And that's not, I'm not kissing your ass or blowing smoke. Mm -hmm. I'm like, cause you can tell I'm a fucking music nerd. I just, just, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, I wish I would, you're, you're the kind of person too that will say when they don't like something, which I respect. No, I would. I'd be like that. That's not working for me. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No offense. But, um, mm -hmm. this album, it terrified me for 49 mm -hmm. minutes, but in a weird almost a narcotic sort of way. I felt like I was like on a, like I'd taken sleeping pills. Well, it, it, the record sounds that way because it was made in a really strange way. And it was made like a lot of records that have probably come out in the past year. So like it was the pandemic. In a right? vacuum. In a vacuum. Yeah, we're just all isolated. Um, you know, everything was just done long distance. Um, the way we kind of made that record was we basically were all sharing logic set. We all kind of work in logic. Right at the recording program and so yep. yeah 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 so we um so someone would start a song idea usually josh um in logic and then he would he would kind of um upload the logic session and then we could all access it and add our own thing and do tweaks and then say hey i just updated and added something check it out go, okay yeah, yeah what's that you do that in sessions in logic you're able to go to a cloud is that the deal yeah we did it um I, was it dropbox or something like that you know it was just kind of sharing yeah Camera, I, I guess it was Dropbox, but um, probably Dropbox, yeah. Yeah, it was a, a really interesting way to work, and then Toby ended up doing mixing the record, and that that actually kind of like mi the mix was kind of part of the composition. Like some of, some of the songs are pretty like still pretty abstract before we mix them. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The back part of the album gets very abstract. Because, yeah, and um, the, the early part you're like oh, it's a little bit more song oriented. What's that? They're a little more singer song, or, yeah. but they're still, but they're still, man, they're still just. I don't know how to put it any other way. They're fucking weird, yeah. but they're beautiful weird in this experimental sort of way that if you're into, if you're into industrial, and I'm not talking like hardcore IDM, but you know, right? Yeah, you're more like early like, early '80s industrial, right? If you're into that, or you you like a little bit of maybe, maybe like throbbing or skinny, as I said, mm -hmm. skinny where you. you you know, there's still a lot. Their melody is still right. There. Yeah, yeah. If you like, like I said, the the biggest one I kept hearing was Rain Tree Crow. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I have that record. That one record they put out. Yeah, that was their last real Japan album, but it mm -hmm. wasn't Japan. But mm -hmm. it sounded like a fucked up Rain Tree Crow album where it was mm -hmm. like all these weird things kept coming in and out of the mix, yeah. but yet yeah. there was still the the um skeletal or the skeleton of. An actual pop song in a weird yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it almost sounds like abstract remixes of like of like a normal pop song. That's a good way to put it. Like, yeah. exactly. Um, let's see. So, but you said that, that you, you did record, you have done live, but you haven't done it in a long time. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So we did, we did, we never really done any like real touring. You know, we, we got offered, um, we had, we put out a record called The Missing in, as our second record around 2013 or something. And mm -hmm. that's kind of, I would say that's probably most, that's probably like most people's favorite record. I feel like accessible one. Is it more accessible? Probably the most, it's definitely the most successful one. I would say. Okay. I still really like that album. Um, and the, around that time we put out that record, we, we did play a lot of shows locally. And then we would do some like regional stuff, go up to Connecticut or upstate New York. We got offered like a whole Alcest tour. I'll say, I would say. Ooh, Alcest. Yeah. Alcest. Um, yeah, I could see Needs loving you guys. Yeah. Yeah. He likes, uh, he, he he was aware of our band and I think wanted us to go on uh, one of their tours for like a month, but we, we couldn't do it. Um, and that was around the time, I guess, that we were recording or putting out color stands. You know, I had too many commitments with workouts and all that other stuff. Um, yeah, man. I, it's, 
I would imagine doing it now, you'd have to run a lot of backing tracks, though. I would think to make it. Uh, sound yeah, like we talk, you know, yeah, we talked about you know eventually playing a show again, and and we're like, ah, it's going to be kind of harder to pull off this doer stuff without having yeah some auxiliary extra musicians or yeah backing tracks, which I'm not the biggest fan of using live, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you're continuing. Okay, so incredibly cool stuff. I'll be checking those three albums out, and I will be buying some of that stuff. Although you said it's only digital, right? Um, the Vora, I have like I have um, I mean I have some copies of the of the third Vora record called Sable. Okay. If you want, let to me check that one out, and I'll I'll uh I'll connect with you. Um, so you're continuing your writing sh- relationship. We're gonna move on. We're gonna get uh-huh. to a couple more big ones. I want to hit quick before we let you out of here. Uh, you're continuing your writing la- relationship with Jamie Myers from Sabbath Assembly in Veldoom, which we'll get to in a second. But uh-huh. I take it. SA is ended at this point as far yeah, as yeah. End? okay yeah yeah that band kind of came to an end in 2019 or something just because everybody decided to do other things I was mainly our drummer kind of decided to kind of yeah put the band the rest at the time he was kind of just kind of going through some different life changes and stuff and um I was like a little bit surprised because we had just kind of I really liked that record we put out the last one we put out and um, we did like a European tour that I thought went pretty well so and we started writing we have like half of a record written um that we just I don't know I was ever going to have with this stuff now but um so we were yeah we were planning to re- make another record but um yeah the band's kind of uh, yeah not 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 active right now so you talking about a red letter uh, a letter, letter of red, red? Okay. yeah yeah so that was 19 um yeah, I gotta say, I didn't know about this band, and I'm listening to it. I'm like, Jesus Christ, this is killer stuff. The guitar work is really killer. I mean, obviously, the feature is on Jamie to mm-hmm. a large extent, but I mean, it's <sighs> well. Let me see what I wrote here. I wanted to see if I well, I got something down a little further. We'll get to that. Um, I was kind of blown away by the band sound, but the early albums, the process. Uh, the earth, we're about the process church of the final mm-hmm. judgment and a lot of very esoteric occult themes. Can you elaborate on was, were any band members involved with that? Or was it just you guys using that as a muse for lyrics or. So, yeah, when I, you know, so there's a, the first half of the Sunday record, I, I'm not a part of the second record is called Ye Are gods. That's the first one, Jamie. That's when Jamie joined the band. Um, mm-hmm. That one I played on, but just one song, and I was kind of just a session musician on that record, so it wasn't really contributing right. anything. Um, so it wasn't until like the third record called Quaternity mm-hmm. that I, I kind of joined the band and started kind of contributing material. And that's also the record where it kind of started to break away from the Process Church stuff. Okay. The whole Process Church thing was mainly our drummer Dave, Dave Nuss. That's kind of his. Uh, that was his idea, you know. And at a certain point, you know, like yeah, after two records, I guess it was like, let's. But I okay. guess was he a member or was he just? No, I think he just um, he just has like you know he's just really um, interested. Sort of obsession about it. Yeah, he was just something he was really interested in. Okay, um, I didn't check those out, so I just was curious about that because I read it. Like, I, mean, I knew that name. I knew that Process Church name from other stuff I'd heard, and I'm like, I wonder if you know because it's kind of a sketchy, weird sort of. Yeah, they're, 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 there's they're a little bit end of time. It's kind of. Um, if I recall correctly, it's kind of similar, somewhat to like Doe, the uh, like the whole Heaven's Gate thing. Yeah, the Heaven's Gate thing. Although they're not suicidal, but they're, no, um, you know, so, what's the what's the crazy ones that all the stars are in? Um, L. Ron Hubbard shit, the Dianetics guy. Right. They're, they're kind of like that, only in more of like a hippie, dippy, weird way. But they also like worship. They worship God and Satan. They saw yeah. this like yeah duality. Like, yeah yeah which is you know an intriguing concept but um i guess i don't worship either so that's yeah I me mean, neither it's funny because i'm not i'm not also not a religious person not a religious guy I, and honestly i was kind of glad that we kind of you know that was we moved, was cool. on. We moved on yeah. yeah so here's um yeah okay so the only one i listened to was a, re- a letter of red and that was the last thing i got to listen to mm-hmm. i, I want to dig further into that material a little bit mm-hmm. and get back in because what's the one before that from 17 called uh it's called uh rites of passage yeah do you have any of those you want to show real quick or I have a, yeah i'm gonna blow you up on the solo layout Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I might talk a little over it, and you can then too. But so this is um, Sabbath Assembly that you're showing right here. 
everybody knows what the gore guts look like, and dysrhythmia is pretty available. So yeah, I don't know if uh, you know what I have no idea where my letter of red record is, but uh, yeah, this is the uh, that's the one. What's that called? That's, that's the seven rites of passage. Yeah, yeah, I read some uh, pretty cool reviews on that one. That's one I'm going to check out next. This is probably the proggiest like record of ours. Okay, and uh, you were involved a lot in that, right? Yeah, this record is probably has the most sort of like band collaborate i mean yeah most collaborative kind of like songwriting on it yeah i like that artwork too is that is that jamie yeah. or yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay yeah this this artist has kind of gone on to do uh some bigger things lately like stuff for like tool and Arch oh and really oh yeah. shit <laughs> but jamie just found him on instagram like years ago and no way and uh, i think this uh, a lot of these uh yeah i think this record co uh, cover got seen by some of those people that are now using him that's cool good for him yeah yeah um so my assessment okay so Veldoon, uh -huh. which you're working with jamie as well in um quite a bit different from a sabbath assembly uh -huh. and i have to tell you dude this is my second favorite record i listened to of yours oh cool um m mind-blowingly cool thanks just uh, your guitar tones on here your choices of chord phrasings um the well here's what i wrote so my assessment of Valduna is like it's like listening to a film noir flick play out in your head and more pointedly a david lynch film mm -hmm. that's happening in front of your eyes love the buttery warm clean guitar tones on all the tracks including uh, i don't know what okay i i got three lines there don't don't belong there Super yeah. sultry, mysteriously obtuse and unapproachable. I hear a lot of Concrete Blonde. Yeah. Cocteau Twins, for sure. Maybe This Mortal Coil a little bit in there. Calexico, I hear. Yeah. Um, a rem remote strains of 10,000 Maniacs, even. Too, oh, yeah. okay. um, Dead Can Dance. There's definitely Dead Can Dance vibes to it. It's not world music like Dead Can uh, Dance, but I hear yeah. that. You know, maybe into the realms of a dying sun or the realms of a dying sun. I hear a little bit of that mysticism in the in the music yeah. itself. Um, mm -hmm. And I definitely hear cure tones in your guitar tones. Okay, I hear Robert Smith guitar tones yeah, yeah. big time. Um, particularly, probably like nah, probably disintegration, maybe kiss me, kiss me era, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, and I even hear a little bit of massive attack without the electronic thing. Oh, I just okay. those were the reference points I kept like cool. spinning around. Because when I listen to people, I don't I listen to it for what it is. Right. But of course, to explain it, you gotta kind of go and say, well, I, it's that. I mean, that's cool. I mean, what I like about talking to people like you is that you listen to a, you have a deep music collection and you know a lot, of, you know a lot of different kinds of music and, and genres and bands, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's funny because like um a lot of times bands don't want to hear that they sound like other bands because a lot, times, a lot of times, um, I think because a lot of times when people are like, this reminds me of this, losing what they're saying is some sort of like really popular mainstream band that, that makes the band cringe because they're like, no, our influencers are way more obscure. Yeah, we don't want to know. We don't want to be compared to them. But, but all the stuff you're mentioning for like Vora and, and now um, Veldun is like, Totally on the money, you know. It's like, yeah, all those, all those artists. I mean, I, I didn't think Massive Attack so much, but, but I like Massive Attack. I just, no, but it's not it's, a conscious influence. But. Yeah, it's not the, it's not the electronic Massive Attack. Mm -hmm. It's more the atmosphere. Atmosphere, right? I can yeah. see that. Yeah. yeah, and so, um, what I wanted to finish with was, you know, for me, the entire album is full of stellar songs and showcases Jamie's really incredible voice and mm -hmm. your gorgeous lush guitar playing 98 percent of which is clean tones there's very little yeah. distorted yeah. tones on this at all and tr chasing <laughs> down the sun killer track a glimpse of being is really cool that's a little more up tempo and you know what i heard in there man and again this is what i heard but you could say dude i don't know where you're coming from but yeah. are you familiar with brighter than a thousand suns man yeah totally i mean yeah, I know that that tempo change kind it's, of towards end. Yeah, but it's no, but it's got yeah. Jordy's guitar tone at the end. Mm. I mean, not exact, but it's mm. just the the way we were, we, were, we, were, words. we were calling that the killing joke part. So were yeah. you really? Yeah, dude, I'm good, bro. You I'm are. Good. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, that's my favorite killing joke album. So that's why I. Right yeah, I, I, I love their uh, mid mid eighty stuff. Yeah, but um, 
So, yeah, um, that's – what were you going for as far as tones and influences on this album? Because it shows – to me, it really shows a side of your guitar playing that – Probably a lot of Gorgots fans just would be like, wait, this is that guy? Are you kidding oh, yeah. me? You know, yeah. um, it's truly evocative of here's what I felt like when I was listening to it mm -hmm. over and above all the other things that I put. You know, I think visually and somewhat synesthetically, I guess, is kind of the word, not in colors, but more in atmospheres and things that are around me. And what I kept thinking was it's truly evocative of, of the open road in the desert at night under a full moon with the windows down. Mm. and intoxicated with the wonder of the world around you it's just you just you're surrounded by this coolness mm. and I, I gotta tell you dude that album kind of blew my mind i sent it to my daughter who's a singer mm. a budding singer mm. and she's you know if you heard her maybe i can send you some stuff at some point but mm. um if you heard her she's kind of like a, a mix of chelsea wolf Marissa Nadler, who I want to talk to you about mm. real quick. Mm. Um, probably some Kate Bush in there. Mm. Not her voice, but just in her, what she's doing musically and stuff like that. Because she's got acoustic doom folk sort of tracks. And then she's got more, what I'd call more of an upbeat pop sort of, avant pop sort of sensibility. Mm. I sent this to her and she's like, oh my God, dad, who is this? Mm. I'm like, well, it's a band I didn't even know about until today. <laughs> yesterday That's actually cool. yeah. when you sent me the link and i'm like yeah. it's a, I'm, I'm interviewing this guy and i know him from this and this but i had mm -hmm. no idea that was a side of your plan and it's amazing oh thanks yeah i mean the point of that band you know was like yeah we didn't you know want it to sound like sabbath assembly because you know it's it's me and jamie so obviously it's going to sound a little bit like sabbath assembly yeah but she does sound different on this i think yeah i mean we just approached it totally differently yeah and i knew right off the bat i wanted to use like mostly clean tones kind of these twangy more yeah stratty kind of although i used a gretch for most of the but it kind of like yeah stuff like um yeah chris isaac just that kind of like twang absolutely man out. that that tone that uh full <laughs> what's it called the the big track he did uh oh. wicked game yeah. what's it called wicked game wicked game that's it yeah. i mean what oh the guitar playing on that is just sublime man the guitar player yeah and his band is is really great and and um you mentioned concrete blonde like that guitar player in that band is amazing too oh yeah i forget i, I start getting really into these players that really i mean i've always liked players like this you could say but even more so in recent years these players that just like play for the song and they they play really interesting things but just at the right moments you know and yeah his name's james something Marcole right or something like that yeah, i can't remember his name i know yeah. jeanette is sort of the focus but there's a time man where i just just been early 90s mm -hmm. binged on concrete blonde like crazy man yeah, so yeah. damn good and th mm -hmm. and that it reminded me of concrete blonde but it wasn't like a rip or anything it's uh, definitely got its own thing yeah we're still trying to like throw in our own you know hopefully unique spin on things but. will you play live with them at all yeah yeah i mean that's the plan um it's hard because jamie's in texas um you know but the 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 rest of us me johnny and, and jeff um so jeff from disturbing also plays drums in Belgium. oh okay so we're all pretty much you know our johnny lives in new jersey but he's not that far you know but anyway we've been talking about rehearsing together instrumentally to get it yeah get a set together and then probably have jamie fly out and did you do a lot of sabbath assembly live stuff that band, yeah, that band did tours and went to Europe and did stuff. Um, but, um, yeah, I hope Feldoon can do more. Yeah, like, yeah, do stuff like that. Um, we'll Is see. that standard tuning you're playing in for that? Uh, yeah, actually, the except for the last song, the acoustic song at the very end. Um, that's like a 12-string acoustic song that was in some weird tuning when I wrote the song. But, yeah, everything else is all the electric guitar stuff on that record is, is standard, but I use capos a lot, so, like, Okay, so, I mean, so, so the key's different then. Yeah, so like you know, the sound of the open strings is different because of the capo. Okay. Because yeah, because you're you're you're. It's um, still standard tuning. Yeah. I guess we should quick mention. Is there any other things that I didn't mention other than your band camp, which um, mm -hmm. you've got a lot of material on there that I would call Kevin Tronics. There's a lot mm -hmm. of Kevin Tronics on there where you're yeah. doing a lot of Fripp inspired sort of layer, multi layer stuff. And the one that jumped out at me big time was your. Uh, the Halloween one. Oh yeah. Which is super um, freaking cool and yeah. pretty fucking evil sounding. <laughs> yeah. Just for just guitars for yeah, the most yeah. part. Yeah. I thought it'd be cool. Yeah, I thought it'd be fun and cool to like, yeah, just pick a couple of like, you know, sort of 
Halloween-ish, uh, whether they were TV themes that kind of scared me as a kid or, or just things from horror movies. But um, yeah, just do it all on guitar, you know, um, it was kind of fun. I, I, I like to do more of those. This has been hard to find the time. Um, or I, do, I guess some of it's a little bit like, what is, I don't know. I, I, I guess there's other priorities. It's not like a main priority, but I think it'd be fun to do at least one more of those. Like I have some more ideas in mind of, of like Halloween movie type Mm. songs and themes i would like to cover so you you teach and i imagine you do zoom and Streamyard mm. type lessons mainly yeah. now or what yeah i have a couple of in-person students um you know I, I um but even most of my local students still we still just do zoom because everyone's just gotten so used to it but um yeah you don't have to run over to the house and pack yeah and I, I live a little like what even's like a little a little bit out of the way for some people um even i'm not that far from a subway stop um yeah people you know it's time consuming to get on the subway and like trek out somewhere um some of my students have cars and, and parking's not too bad out here so some some of my students will will drive out here and we'll do it i prefer in-person lessons i mean it's definitely better you know, you know it's easier to like well it's a lot easier to show them and kind of you, you and know, like you, play together yeah and, right right but, uh, but what uh, what do you what though. are you charging out do you do hours half hours what do you do I, I would do an hour. Or some um, on the rare occasion, someone might want to do a two-hour lesson, but mostly it's a, a yeah. I just do hour lessons. What do you charge an hour? Um, only forty. For, Dude, you could be doing way more than that. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna raise my prices because yeah. it's I, I have never raised. I mean, that's for weekly. I charge more if it's bi-weekly, and then more if it's monthly. But I, I've never raised my rates since I started, which was ten years ago. So I really wow. need to because it's not it's not um. It's not enough to like. Well, do me a favor. If I if I sign up for some, don't change it for me. <laughs> yeah. I can be flexible with people, but yeah, I know, I know. I mean, most people charge, especially in New York, it's so expensive to live here. Oh, I would imagine. I know. I'm sure you're aware of guys like uh, Ben Eller. You know Ben Eller, I'm sure, right? I know he is. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and like Andy Wood and some of those guys that have a high profile Instagram mm. uh, thing. Now, Andy, I don't think he's doing lessons, but you know they're charging. 75 man i would i would even think more than that probably but yeah. no nah, i think i knew a dude who was taking unless they changed things recently right. but you know the thing about that that's kind of fucked up kevin is you know my first guitar teacher granted i'm an old man mm -hmm. so I mean, we have to put that out there i'll be 57 in march but my very first guitar lessons i think it was like eight bucks an hour yeah, i think my, i was trying to think of how much did i pay in high school yeah. my mom i guess was paying for my lessons um yeah my yeah, mom did probably yeah. like 10 or 15 dollars i think mine was <laughs> mine was seven or eight bucks yeah maybe mine were 20 by the time i got to high school but yeah i mean and we're talking for me that would have been jesus i'm so old i can't think of what the, um, probably 1978, 77, 78 when I was like 11. Mm -hmm. So, you know, granted, a lot's changed since then. And, you know, it, it's you, you weren't doing Zoom lessons back then, of course. But um, so is there anything we didn't touch on that you wanted to hit on real quick that was, you know, you might want anybody that's still hanging on? And I'll tell you, we did have 14 people at one point in oh, time okay. earlier. Cool. Um, man, I don't know. We talked about, yeah, all the main projects. Um, oh, gear. Can we just hit on gear real quick? Yeah, I don't have much to say about gear because I'm really, I know you're not a super gear head. Do you, do you use like a, do you have a profiler at all or no? You have a Kemper or Axe Effect? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, here's the hilarious thing is I don't, I don't really have an amp. I haven't really owned an amp. Uh, I mean, that sounds ridiculous as a guitar teacher. I do have this line six amp that I use for my lessons. That I found for free in the basement of my house um, when I moved in. No shit. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't own my own like nice amp. I mean, I should get one, but like, it's funny because like I, I, you know, I play in a couple different bands with Colin, for instance, and every time you know we have yeah, practice so. or, or play a show, he's got all these. Yeah, amps he's got everything for he's you. Like, yeah. I, he's like, just use my, just borrow one of mine. So borrow but, my matchless or my. You know, whatever. I imagine he's got really killer. Yeah, he's got a nice variety of stuff. I mean, but guitars on the other hand, I have a lot of guitars. Um, but so you primarily use plugins when you're recording at this point now, or what? Um, so like my, um, well, like my yeah, my solo stuff is on my like the ambient stuff. Mm -hmm. is mostly, um, yeah, I use pedals and stuff, but yeah, it's kind of direct into the computer. Right. Yeah, not no, not going through any amps. Um, other solo stuff of mine, like some of there's there's records on my Bandcamp that are more like 
just acoustic guitar finger style stuff and and that stuff i i go i record with colin usually um so that it sounds. what are you what are your acoustics i have um i have a taylor six string and a taylor 12 string and a a really uh one of my favorite guitars is this Takamini uh, acoustic that I have. That's oh, yeah, like, Takamini's, yeah. I bought for like 400 bucks, but I love it. Like, I've used that on a bunch of recordings. I, I write, I kind of play that one more than my Taylor, even though the Taylor maybe technically sounds better, maybe. But, um, is your, is your Taylor a cutaway or a dreadnought or? Yeah, all my, all my acoustics, cutaway. I have a classical nylon string too, and that's also a cutaway. Like, I, all my acoustics are cutaways. So I, I like to play high up. I was out, uh, with my daughter when she was home. From, she's in Asheville. Uh-huh. And um, we went to Guitar Center. First time I'd been out to a guitar store in probably, f- oh, man, four years or so. Mm-hmm. And I had to sell all my stuff. I was a PRS guy at a Custom 22 and Fender Strat, American Strat, and mm-hmm. a, a Gibson Les Paul. And I, uh, Martin D28, and I had to sell all that stuff because of my health situation. Mm-hmm. And long story short, that's it. The, what you see back there, the, the ovations my mm. last that's that's it mm. i love that guitar though man it plays like an electric it's got the thin body and the cutaway mm. and everything and it's i've abused the shit out of that thing it needs a refret really 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 bad mm. um but we went out and we went in and i'm like yeah they're not gonna have anything at this store because they over the years you could see they were getting shittier stuff oh, in and yeah. they weren't selling the good stuff you know the 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 petrucci models would sit there forever and then they disappear and so long story short, we went in there and I walk in the acoustic room. I'm like, Jesus, they have some really nice shit in here. Mostly tailors. Mm. They had a tailor, a Koa. There's a there's a name for it, and I can't remember what the model is. Doesn't matter. Sixty two hundred dollars, right? And mm. I'm like, man, they're never gonna sell that around here unless some lawyer shows up here and buys right. it for his wife or you know his daughter yeah. or whatever. Mm. I said, can I? Can I? And it was of course way up. And they finally learned they lock all their guitars in. I, you know, yeah. the last time I was there, they didn't. So mm. you know, you see some hack pick up a yeah. four thousand dollar guitar and clunk, and you're like, oh, you just you know. Mm. So they pulled it down, and I played it. And also, they had a Martin. It's called a thirteen. I think it's called a 13 CE. So it's a cutaway too. Mm. Man, I, that was 1500. And I was like, man, I, ooh, I don't know which one I would take over the 62 mm. of that. But boy, that, that Taylor was just the resonance, man. You just got those, you'd strike those, those low notes, those low E's that you'd play an E chord yeah. and it would just hang in the air. And you could almost like reach out and, grab it and it's yeah the taylor i i um you know i i use that a uh, taylor acoustic it sounds particularly good for anything strummy or like le- on the rare occasion i do like an acoustic lead mm-hmm. kind of thing. the taylor's great um the talk to me i like more for like finger just if i'm playing like just like finger style, finger style yeah it's a little bit easier to play um my taylor 12 string is one of my absolute favorite guitars i own that thing just i actually kind of luji always try to find somewhere to use that on every record i do Somewhere there's a Taylor 12 string. I usually like on the metal stuff even, but Luigi has an overdub that's kind of tucked away in the mix. Or something. Okay. I just love using that. Yeah, I just love using that guitar. It sounds so good. Well, I mean, you know, the 12 string just has such a killer, unique sound. And, mm-hmm. you know, as a, as a giant Lifeson fan, you know, where he, when he plays it on Xanadu, it's just like, you know, yeah. it's mm-hmm. just like crazy. But, um, yeah, so you do the you do the. Uh, where can they get you if they? I think I put everything in the links, but I'm not sure I did anything about the 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 um, guitar teaching. You want to tell people where they can find you? Oh well, there's this. I have a dot com site, um, kevinhuffnagel.com. Um, they can come. Yeah, you can just kind of go there or learn more about the lesson thing. Uh, yeah, they can find me on Instagram. I'm pretty easy to find, you know. So um, yeah, but it, you can just write to me directly or DM me or. I'm pretty easy to find. So yeah, anybody out there that's interested in lessons, get in touch. Um, it's kind of what absolutely, I man. This guy's this guy's a fantastic player that is multidisciplinary, and you're not just a metal dude. You're not. In fact, I love your metal playing, but I mm-hmm. think I like your other playing better, which is mm-hmm. kind of cool. You know, mm-hmm. most most guys want to hear that, and I I think that's you know the case here. You want to do the game real quick? You got yeah, sure. seven mm-hmm. minutes. We'll do. We'll rip through these. If okay. you don't know them, you just pass on it. 
Okay. Say, I don't know it. You know, if you uh, trash it by trash, and I don't mean you're talking shit about it. It's just not not my thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, you're re you're ready here. I'm gonna. I, all, I, all I say is pass or trash. Like pass, I don't know it. Trash. Yeah, I pass, know. I don't know it. Trash. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, it's not my thing. And then if it's if it's a keep if it's treasure, and you're keeping it. Uh, give me one or two quick lines on what okay. what you feel about. It. Sound good? So, all right. Yes. All right, I'm gonna blow myself up here for a minute so you can. Can I? Yeah, there we go. Up there. Uh -huh. You know this band. Brilliant. Okay. So I had um, sorry, I should just say pass or trash, I guess, but like. No, you don't uh, have to do it that way. Just there's, 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 there's bands like Marilly where I'm just like, God, I guess I don't I don't have a strong opinion because I had um script for a jester's tear. Mm -hmm. Like I bought that like used at a CD shop in high school because I was like, I'm in the Prague. I've heard about this band. Let me destroy this record. And um I couldn't yeah, at the time I couldn't get that into it. Um, I guess they're one of those bands that I always think like I should revisit one day, but I just haven't. So, haven't done uh, it. I guess I've heard that it's a, that's a good record by them, but I, I don't know. Well, that's kind of their big one that kind mm -hmm. of was dubbed the big one. Um, yeah, I think if I was going to recommend, Script is a little bit more proto-Genesis or... or I think it was a little too theatrical sounding for me or something. A little yeah. Too way -ish or something. I don't know. This one's a little bit more, I want to say it's got a little bit more pop influence in, in uh, it, but it's still very, let me look at something real quick. I, wanna, I don't want to say... You know, actually, it's not my favorite. The the, mm -hmm. the one after that is called um, Clutching at Straws. Okay, I've heard of it. Yeah. I would say that's the one to start with. Right. Um, just a fucking amazing album. All of their first four with Fish to me are sacrosanct. They're just, uh, they mean so much to me. I bought Script in 1983 on, you know, the little cassette with the tiny little picture on it. And I wore that, I burned that thing out. I went through two or three copies of it, but I get it, you know, I mean, but I also, the odd thing was that of all the prog bands, Genesis was the one I didn't gravitate. I also to. have a hard time with Genesis. Um, Do you? Yeah. Um I'm better now, uh -huh. although they're probably down the list from Crimson and Yes and mm -hmm. Vandergraaf. They're probably the like Vandergraaf generator. Yeah. Yeah, they're probably like fifth or sixth mm -hmm. on my list of the big, you know, Floyd even. They're, mm -hmm. they're below Floyd. And it's not because I don't think they're incredibly talented. Um and it's not even too that, you know, when they went oh shit. When they went with Phil Collins, when Gabriel left, mm. um, that he acquitted himself incredibly well. You know, a trick of the tail and mm. you know, selling England and all that stuff. But I don't know, selling England was um, Peter. But Wind and Weathering, I mean, they're great albums, but I just, I don't know, man. There's something about them that just, I never was like the biggest fan. But in a weird way, then I kind of, Transfix some of that love to Marillion. Those first four albums just do everything. I'll, I'll have to check them out. Yeah, I, I would say try Clutching or um, uh, Misplaced Childhood. Okay, see what you think. And this is what I was talking about the the all of the tall, okay. yeah, all the, all the tolls are like this four yeah. four or five CDs. This one has a making of Blu Ray and everything like nice. that. And last time I saw these were going for five or six hundred dollars. Believe it or not, yeah. crazy. Because they were very limited. All right, man. I don't know what your feeling is on this band. I'll be interested to see. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I love. I, I uh, you know, Queen's like such an uh, an eclectic, eccentric band that um, there are one of yeah. You know, there's a lot of bands like this though, where I'm like, I really appreciate this band because they sound so unique. No one sounded like that. They're instantly identifiable. Oh yeah. They're all incredible musicians. Um, yeah, Queen for me is like uh, I really love some of their songs. I really don't like some of their songs. So yeah, you know it kind of depends on the song, I guess. Um, Ryan May is a guitar player. I, oh. I really enjoy. I love his, his approach to layer a layering again. You know, guitar right. player, harmony. Um, so yeah, incredibly. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of respect for Queen for sure. Cool. Let's see what you think of this band here. If you've been watching my my channel at all, you know that I'm a huge fan of this band. Oh, King's X, yeah, um, yeah. I I, I was uh, I was really big into King's X as uh, even like pretty early on because I, I grew up um, when I was in middle school, like late eighties, mid late eighties. I was um, living at the time in northern New Jersey, and I was there's that station. It's still around called W S O U. It's like oh, S O U out of uh, Seton Hall, right? Or yeah, 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 yeah. So they they would always play King's X. Right. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so I would always hear King's X on when I was listening to SOU. Um, and um, yeah, really, and, you know, and then I started seeing their videos on MTV, like on Headbangers Ball and stuff. And, um, do you have a favorite really, album or do you? I, uh, you know, I didn't really, I kind of dropped off with them a little bit after the the self-titled one, I guess. Um, I, I still really love Gretchen Goes to Nebraska. I mean, the uh, first two I really like a lot. Um, Gretchen's my favorite. That's the, yeah, that's, kinda, me, that's your classic. And man, the first album is not far behind it. And I love Dog Man too, because they, uh, they kind of went heavier and darker and a little bit more nastier. And, you know, yeah, I, actually, Dogman, I guess that came after the self title. I guess that was kind of Dogman was maybe the last one I really kind of like checked out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about this is a more modern band? It's probably the only modern band I let me look here. Yeah, this is pretty much the only modern band. I, all right, so we'll do this one first. Uh -huh. I'll leave that one for last. So this was the band that I was talking about hearing at Relapse. Okay. And is likely my first. It was either this or Carner's Mental Vortex. I can't remember which one I've got. But... Okay, yeah, Autopsy, I, I don't really uh, – I never really listened to them, honestly. Really? Yeah, I would you know, hear about them. Uh, strangely enough, I, I checked out something from their newest record out of curiosity. I, uh, it was really random. I don't know. It's just like yeah, I forget the. We were talking about them, and I was like, well, "Well, let me just check out this new song, or whatever." But um, anyway, I've never, I've never heard any of their old stuff, so I, I have no opinion. Okay, it. that's yeah. fair. Yeah. Oh, you were talking about. Oh well, hold on. We'll do this one too. I got two here that I'll wait towards the end. But all right, man. You should know this band, I would think. I know you know the name. I don't know if you know the album. Oh, Abba. Yeah, okay. This is the one with um, Mamma Mia, mm. uh, Hey, Hey, Helen, uh, and then my favorite song of theirs by far, SOS. Holy shit, that song rules. So Abba, I only I only know the hits. Um, I know, I, I've never listened to any of their records. I hate to be honest with you. I kind of only do two, two. I have the box set right here. Mm -hmm. Check it out. I have the... the um, the box set of all the albums, except uh -huh. for the recent one that they came out with. And I, I still, you know, the, the hits are just so f incredible, you know, that you're like, you almost want to go back and listen to them over because they were so good. You know what, know what I do like is, um, uh, again, I, I only know the single, I guess it was the only single, but um, Frida, was that her name from ABBA? She put Frida, out like, yeah, yeah. that single. Uh, something, something going on. Yeah, yeah. Something <laughs> going on. on. Yeah, that's a great song. Dude, that song fucking rules. It's so... Uh -huh. It's so haunting, man. Yeah, that's a great like, song. Yeah, I, that's um, yeah. What was was it? Just Frida? I guess it was just Frida, right? That's. I think it just came out under her name, just Frida. Yeah, did and you, I think Phil Collins you, plays on that drum. He does. Thing. You're right. Yeah, and the drumming is. Well, it's funny. I I wonder if that came out before. In the, in the air, air at night. I know because it has that same. Man, it's got that same tone and a. Yeah, fucking rules. I love her voice on that. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. That's cool. Um, okay, this one here. We got four more to go. We'll, we'll mm -hmm. make them quick. You know, I love Roxy music. Yeah, love Roxy music. So um, this is kind of their quintessential masterpiece, I guess. You'd yeah, say. yeah. Um, um, yeah, I have the box set of them, but this, not to get weird, but man, this is the greatest album to have sex to in all of the world uh, it's just the best it's uh yeah it's kind of one of the first albums my my wife and i bonded over when we met like the yeah the, yeah the i got record. you yeah i got you all right man now this one i'm gonna be real curious do you do much electronic music do you like a lot of electronic i do i mean um i ha i haven't uh yeah i mean i've, I've only d really done one record ever where i've messed around with since no but i mean as far as listening to it um, yeah, listening to it. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. I'll be really curious to know if you know this band and this this album. Uh, Boards of Canada? Uh-huh. Another band? You know, I've heard little bits and pieces, but never sat down with the whole record. Kevin. Yeah. Kevin. Kevin. Listen to this album. Which what which one is that? Geo Gaddy. Okay. It's a fucking masterpiece. You know what's crazy about it? It's 66 minutes and six seconds long, and the whole uh -huh. album is all about occult and Satan, satanic things. Uh -huh. But you would never know that if you didn't know that. If You get what I mean? You would never know that. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant album, dude. Okay. 
check this out. You'll thank me later, I think. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna check out all this stuff you're talking about. Yeah. All right. Um, I don't know if you know these guys. You probably do. I would. Well, wait. No, we'll do that one last. All right. All right. You talked about this guy, so I'll be curious uh -huh. to know what you think of this particular thing. <laughs> oh, Badlands. Yeah. I mean, I, I. Okay. So I had that on cassette when I was a kid. Um, and actually, Highwire. Yeah. The first song, Highwire. I remember. Oh. Learning, I remember learning that as a kid from a guitar magazine. I had the, their. You know, I had a magazine yeah. with tabs, and I had the tabs on it. Yeah, it was kind of one of the first. I think when I finally started to develop some, a little bit of technique, that was one of yeah. the first things I tried. Well, yeah, because you got to really be able to grind in on that da -da, with the da -da 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 -da, and you're doing the hammer on the pull off thing. Yeah, yeah. Fucking Jake on this album is. I love Jake. It's such a. I mean, my favorite stuff is obviously the Aussie stuff, the Badlands stuff. Sorry, I like that record. I mean, it got a little too. A little more country, a little more southerny on the next one. A little too Zeppelin-y, like like blues rocky for me. Um yeah, this one has Winner's Call, which is killer, and mm -hmm. Seasons on here and Cry Street Cry Freedom. And I mean, look, you know, I mean, regardless of what happened with Ray, I mean, that guy's mm -hmm. voice was just fucking phenomenal, man. Mm -hmm. So all right, last one, and these, you know, these may be friends of yours or guys you know, I don't mm -hmm. know. But if so, you know, and you don't like it, but I don't know why you wouldn't. But um, a blood incantation. Yeah, yeah. Time is zero. It's I, kind of their homage to Tangerine Dream, basically. Yeah, yeah, I checked it out. Um, yeah, it's cool. I thought I think there's like some acoustic guitar kind of blended in with mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. that was cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, guys? yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, I know them. Um, I mean, yeah. I've met, met them a few times, and um, yeah, nice, nice dudes. Um, like their music. I, actually, it was funny. I was, just, I was just teaching a blood incantation song. Uh, were you really? My student asked to learn it, so I was kind of. Um, yeah. They, what were they play? Drop D or is it D flat? Uh, the song I was teaching. I don't know if this is like their regular tuning, but it was. Uh, it was drop C, so it was like D standard with the oh, D standard with the drop C. That is what they play, and you're right. Yep, okay. yep, yep. Yeah. I mean, you, you definitely hear the morbid angel there. Um, yeah, it's funny. Hear, like when I was, I you know, I've, I've heard the records. I've seen them live. Um, at least once, maybe twice. Um, but I never, you know, tried to. It wasn't until a student asked to learn the song that obviously I had to learn the song. So, like, when I was learning the song, I was like, oh, yeah, I could. I, different parts are like, this reminds me of this band. This reminds me of this band. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're not, they're not bashful about it, Paul. And, and all of them are, you know, they're huge music nerds too, like us. And they're, you, you know, there's only so many notes, man. There's 12 notes. Oh, no, I'm not knocking it. I mean, I'm, I'm the same way. Like I said, you know. Um, oh, yeah. That's usually like when we're working on songs. I'm always, you know, um, I'm always like, this is the killing joke part. This is yeah. The you steal, part. yeah. You steal, you steal shit. You can't help but do it. You're not in a vacuum. You but know? it's funny because like a lot of times it's like it doesn't. If you played it, you know, a lot of times like if you, a lot of times it's, it's almost like a joke. You're saying like this is like in this room. We had this one riff one time that we just called the ministry part. And, you know, in this room is something like ministry. <laughs> yeah. But it was just this one part that was just kind of like it was just power chords, just you know. Chuggy, jugga, 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 yeah, jugga, it was just kind of some, some downstroke power chords, and we just called it the ministry part. But it's not like it sounds like a ministry, any ministry song in particular. But I had one last one that fell yeah. off. You much of a Bowie fan? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, another one that I I feel like I, I should um, know more about. Know more about like as far as like yeah his discography. I mean, I funny you uh, should bring that up. Funny mm -hmm. you should bring that up because next Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, my daughter is making her first major appearance with me on here. As mm -hmm. she popped in for the cure, but she can only stick around for about thirty minutes. My daughter, the one that is the singer, is mm -hmm. going to pop in, and well, let's just say her dad sort of forced David Bowie on her, and now it's like she's a David Bowie fanatic. So we're going to do the first third because there's mm -hmm. twenty four or twenty six albums. That's yeah, twenty six. So we're going to do the first eight albums in a deep dive ne on right. next Tuesday. Oh, uh, cool. Which will be live. I don't expect you to sit and watch, but if you're bored and want to pop in for a little bit, make sure you say hi. And yeah, I mean, Bowie's Bowie's my dude, like 100% the guy. I, yeah. Again, I, I, I kind of only know just like, I mean, I know again, the hits, um, but I, I definitely like, you know, black star is amazing. Oh, yeah. unreal. It's probably the one I know the best, actually, strangely enough. Which is crazy because, yeah. you know, he, he died like a few days after it came out. And Yeah. Wow. Hey, real quick, I just want to thank a couple guys that did mm -hmm. say that that said things. We had um, 
Alakazam, Alakazam, whatever there. Totally yeah. surround yourself with great musicians. You talked about that. Fond memories of ordering from Relapse Rezan. Okay, so Justin knows about that. Kudu, you said you knew Kudu yeah. Records. Kudu, yeah. And then the last guy, Carbon Stars here. Thanks for doing it. Hey, man, my pleasure. This has been a fucking awesome interview. Great guy, obviously. Um, picked up a copy of Colored Sands. Wife got it for me for Christmas. That's a cool wife right there, I'm saying. Yeah. And first Gorga, first Gorgut's record somehow. Oh, well, look. You there, the good news for you is there's not a lot of them. So you don't have to go hunt a lot of them down. But I will say this. Uh, Gorguts is a band you must own all the albums by. It's just there's six of them, right? I think. Yeah. yeah six. Six. And, you know, you missed if you didn't go back and listen to the part where we talk about obscure back of ways. Um, you know, it's a polarizing and, and wholly unique experience that even one of the guys in the band says, I can only take up to a certain point that I got to listen to it later. And I mean, it is, it's a very different record that probably has never been done before and wasn't done before and hasn't really been done since. Although that's not really true that that did set a precedent where a lot of technical death metal bands started to go, Oh, they did that on obscure. Let's rip that part off. Cause that happens a lot, you know, it does, but I, I, I still have yet to hear any record that sounds Exactly. Like it, like that, yeah. yeah, yeah. You familiar with Alkaloid at all? Um, yeah, it's a, Christian, Hannes, right? Hannes, Hannes and Christian, Christian Munzer, and yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The second one they did, I, I think it's called Oh, fuck, I'm, I can't remember the name of it now. <laughs> That's terrible. Um, that is a there's some very there's some moments on there, Gore Gutsian. Yeah. But you know, you're talking five world class players, and I mean that that album is pretty incredible. If you ever if you ever see it, I I can't remember the name. I know the first song's called something Colonel, and it sounds like freaking yes mm -hmm. until it gets into the really heavy death parts that you're like, wait, that he was just singing just like John Anderson there. What the hell is that? You know, it's the mm -hmm. dude from Dark Fortress, I think. I know that. Um. He's got a couple of other bands, but um, anyway, dude, I kept you for two hours and 21 minutes. I'm really sorry about that. You probably got to take sorry. a piss. And yeah. You're probably like, man, I'm, I, will this guy just shut the hell up? <laughs> <laughs> no, man, it's been fun. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I presented some cool stuff to you and yeah, yeah. Made, made you think a little bit about some stuff that maybe other interviewers haven't. And um, no, I appreciate you. Uh, yeah. Just kind of, you know, that a lot of this, there's a lot to kind of go through, you know, if you want to yeah. talk about all the different bands. I appreciate you taking the time to. Well, it's look, dude, thank you for, inter by doing this, you really introduced me some, to some amazing music. I, I'm, I'm going to, because of my situation with my health, it's, I don't, I'm in a holding pattern with disability, which is really a struggle, but I get some money, man. I'm definitely going to throw some bo bones your way to get a couple of those things in real time because I just, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a download guy. I just don't. Okay. I, was say, I could send you some, just some download Bandcamp download codes for things. But. Well, I mean, I can just listen to it on YouTube. I mean, granted, it's not the same, but I, um, I want, I want physical products. So, um, I'll, t I'll stay in touch with you. I, I, I would appreciate if you drop the word to luke yeah yeah i'll talk about you see if he'd be interested hell i'd even love to talk to colin but he's probably very very busy so um you know but let me know if if any opportunity arises there or who to talk to and sure, yeah. i'll do that and this was fucking cool man i mean again i you're a you're a a unique guitar player dude thanks um there's not a lot of guys out there like you that can morph you know what i mean like mm. i just don't see ingve playing something like vara or playing something mm. like veldun mm. ingve does ingve non-stop you know yeah, yeah. angus does angus you know and mm. there's not a lot of players like you that have that kind of breadth of appreciation for the guitar and how it fits in many genres yeah and uh it's, it's super cool so thanks i'm glad you appreciate it i mean i just just love all kinds of music you know to me it's just like i can't i can't just stick with anyone we're nerds dude that's yeah. the reality of it we are music yeah. nerds and yeah. i'm glad to have you on the channel which was funny because 
the reason this all ended up happening was because you subscribe to my YouTube yeah, yeah. in the middle of the night at like 3 a.m. You, oh, yeah. you have bad habits like me with regards to sleeping. I, yeah. I, I'm a late, I'm, I'm a night guy and I sleep from like six in the morning till 11 or 12, you know, yeah. but, and I can, because of my condition has a lot to do with it. The pain gets a lot worse at night, but I saw that. I'm like, eh, no, it has to be him. And then I followed it to your, yeah. you have a small YouTube channel that mm -hmm. doesn't have a lot on it. I mean, it's kind of like there's like oh, there's actually a lot of videos on there. Is there? <laughs> yeah, right, maybe yeah. I was maybe I was high that night because I do yeah. use weed sometimes, so I might have missed something there. But um, so go check. I didn't put that down because I didn't really think there was much on there. But I saw it. I'm like, well, yeah, it's definitely him. And I think I wrote a comment on one of your the, your the most recent video that you'd put oh, up, really? like December fifth. Yeah, I left a comment, oh, and I'm really? like, hey man, if you're who I think you are, and I think you are who I, I think you are. I'd love to talk to you about your your music because I know you've got a crazy wide breadth of things like you like a lot of shit like I do. And you've got a lot of styles to you. And I I checked out your band camp and knew that there was more to you than just, you know, dysrhythmia and stuff like that. And I didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything. And then I don't know. I guess I was like, oh, you know what? I didn't even try them on Instagram. Maybe I should try them there. Yeah, I don't think I ever saw the YouTube comment, I guess. Yeah, it's there. I think it was on a video you put like December 5th or 12th for some reason. That sticks in my head. But um, I um and it's cool. We 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 bypassed that, but it's funny because we're in this age now. Just remember, like, if you were let's go back to like 84, right? Yeah, trying to reach out to someone that you, you didn't know. get to meet. Yeah, and, and look, you know, don't take this the wrong way. You're not a rock star like Paul Stanley, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, and I would never get to Paul Stanley, and you wouldn't mm -hmm. want to be probably, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it was his money might not be bad, but anyway, the the internet is so different now. It's it's mm -hmm. close. It's it's created the barrier is barely there in most cases, yeah, or yeah. a lot of cases, and now you know bands are doing meet and greets and shit like that, and you know. They they never would have done that back in the day, you know. Even in 2007, I had to know somebody that I dated that ended up dating Neil Peart's best friend mm -hmm. and riding companion, bike, uh, you know, motorcycle companion. Mm -hmm. And I got to get backstage to meet Kenny and Alex. And I got to tell you, man, it was like, you know, there, there's other than the birth of my children, there was no greater moment in my yeah. life. None. You know I think, I mean? yeah, I've never met them. I, that, that would be definitely like, there There are certain situations where I feel like I would still be starstruck. And I'd yeah, I, I, I was. I saw Alex and I'm like, I started doing the Wayne's World thing. Yeah. I'm like, you know, and as you can tell, I'm a pretty personable and chatty kind of guy. But I'm like, I'm not worthy, man. I'm not worthy. Yeah, and yeah. he just started laughing. He was so cool. Mm -hmm. And before I knew it, I'm like, oh, fuck. Getty standing next to me. I didn't even say hello to him. I'm like, hey, Ged, sorry about that. And he's like, well, hi there. You know, it was like, mm -hmm. I got my two minutes of time with him and a picture. Yeah, awesome. If you look on on my Instagram back a ways, you'll find mm -hmm. pictures of me and me and them. Okay, so damn cool. So, mm -hmm. all right, Kevin, thanks a million, man. Nice it's been fantastic talking to you, and thank you for all your time. I really yeah, appreciate thank it. You. All right, I'll be in yeah. touch. All right, have a good night. I'll see you. Hey, man, take care. Bye.